that are currently on uh, our stream. So meanwhile, let's wait for a couple of more minutes before we start the event. So if you're one of our uh, current viewers and you have not joined our Slack workspace, I request you to do so. So at Slack, we basically discuss everything related to the SDR and the, uh, like, uh, the software defined radio. And, uh, you know, apart from the events, Slack workspace is somewhere uh, you can uh, discuss actively if you have any queries, you have any concerns, uh, or you want to learn something new. So Slack is the uh, place for that. So you can log on to our website, which is www.softwaredefinedradio.in, and you can go to contact us. You can find the Slack logo. You have to simply click the Slack logo and it would redirect you to a Slack workspace. So there are other social media platforms that um, we are also uh, active on. So you can contact us uh, or you can get in touch with us uh, via our email account, which is uh, South Indian SDR user group at the rate gmail.com. And uh, for the latest feeds and updates on the event, you can uh, follow us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is Akashwani, which is A K A S H V A N I 2021. So I'm very curious, like from where people are joining us. So right now, uh, I'm here in Pune, Maharashtra, India, and you know you can uh, join our Slack workspace and drop a hello. Um, my name is Apar and I'm from Pune or something like that. So meanwhile, you can introduce and join our Slack channel. Also, we have a, a, we ha have a presence on GitHub as well. Uh, you can find us on github.com slash South Indian SDR user group. So it would contain all the uh, relevant stuff from our events, presentations from the speakers, as well as additional content uh, which is from the uh, SISDR UG community. So I think uh, we are ready for the event number one. And let us begin. So hello, I would uh, again like to introduce myself uh, my name is Apar, and I'm one of the uh, organizing committee members of the South Indian SDR user group. So uh, welcome to our event number one. Before we begin, I would like to tell you something about us, about the community. So the South Indian SDR group was founded by uh, us, the organizing community, back in January 2021. So our primary agenda was to build a community of people you know, from uh, you are from beginners to expert, uh, spanning all all the uh, different industry from uh, uh, the defense industry, radio industry, or uh, OEMs, like all the different industries, academia, government, and whosoever is interested in the design and implementation of software-defined radio technology. So we are not uh, just uh, limited to software-defined radio. Are, we have a, a very diverse interest, which spans across RF, digital signal processing, wireless communication, operating systems, computer networking, you know, uh, machine learning, software development and optimization, radio hardware, and the list goes on and on. So actually, um, let me tell you what our mission was when we started this community. So the mission of our community was to facilitate the exchange of ideas and enable a greater collaboration within the STR community in India. We personally felt that there is, you know, uh, no proper, uh, you know, a linkage or a community for the SDR here in India. So we started keeping in mind India, uh, the uh, the Indian SDR community, but we are also accessible and well spread across the globe. We host uh, this uh, technical workshops and gatherings, what we call as events every three months and this is our opening event the event number one so um apart from this we also have a dedicated slack workspace as i previously mentioned when we start 
So a Slack workspace is a community area where you can, um, you know, interact with us, interact with the other community members, post your questions, uh, you know, post any uh, any doubt or anything related to uh, radio and SDR in general. And you know, our motto was to you know some someone could you know assist you with that. So we have a dedicated Slack workspace for that, and you'll obviously have the other things like news updates uh, about the upcoming events. So uh, for the channel recordings and for live streaming, we have a dedicated YouTube channel. You simply have to go to YouTube and search for South Indian SDI user group, and you will probably find us there. So you can subscribe to our channel so that you know you don't miss out um, any updates or any event videos that we are going to post on our YouTube channel. Um, you'll find all the relevant you'll find all the relevant code on our GitHub page. And apart from that, we have also a Twitter where we post uh, all the details about the event, when is the next event coming and the relevant news. So yeah, uh, we are not focused or tied to any single one software, hardware platform, some commercial vendor or specific technology. Our agenda uh, for starting this SISDR UG community was it should be a non-profit uh, non -profit community where, you know, people uh, come and share their knowledge and you know we built a, a strong a radio and SDR base here in India. So we are based in Bangalore. Uh, most of the organizing committee uh, members are from Bangalore, but we people uh, we invite people from all across India as well as uh, from outside India to join our community. So please reach out to us on Slack uh, or by email if you have any questions or uh, comments. So thank you so much. That was something about uh, about the community. So now I'll tell you about myself. I'm one of the community members. My name is Apar. Um, I'm currently working with Pia2 as an associate IoT security consultant. Uh, so my major area of um, uh, research and interest lies in hardware security, firmware security, um, RF reverse engineering, and I'm also associated with um, IEEE and IEEE Pune section. Um, apart from that, you know, in my free time, I lo love to produce experimental music. So uh, I request uh, Aditya to go next and tell something about himself. Aditya, are you there? Hey, I'm Aditya Aran Kumar. I am from Chennai, India. So I work majorly in software defined radio, and uh, my interests include uh, hey, signal processing and uh, from Chennai, India. So I work majorly transaction attacks on systems. And, uh, Good to see you all. My interests include. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Aditya. Uh, Balaji. Uh, can you tell the community about yourself? Thank you so much, uh, Balaji, for that introduction. Uh, uh, Neil, can you go next? Sure, thank you. Um, so I'm Neil Pandeya, uh, Neil Pandey. Uh, I'm an SDR Applications Engineer at National Instruments, uh, Edis Research, and I'm located in Austin, Texas in the US, in USA. Uh, my background is in open source software development and wireless communications signal processing and software defined radio. Uh, I've been working at Edis for about six years and uh, I'm originally from, from Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, thank you so much, Neil, for that introduction. Uh, Rohan, can you uh, tell the community about yourself? Yeah, hey, hi everyone, it's great to see you all. Uh, so my I'm Rohan, uh, I'm presently a computer vision engineer at uh, Hypertronics 
devices. Uh, I am a graduate of Stony Brook University uh, in the US. I've worked previously on high performance computing, uh, and I currently work on real time object detection methods. Uh, yeah, so hope to meet you all in the Slack community. Thank you so much, Rohan. Um, so guys, when we started this uh, SISDR community, uh, we had um, you know, uh, another member with us. Uh, his name was uh, Priya Loka Zarya. So he's no more with us. Uh, and uh, he passed away due to COVID-19. So his, uh, his contribution to the uh, SISDR community is beyond words. And uh, so I'll, I'll be speaking uh, something about him. So Priya, Priya Slokarya uh, had a 19 years of professional experience. It was majorly in defense and aerospace domain. He was uh, at the time working uh, with LDRA as a senior technical manager for certification services. He had served in Honeywell and DRDO in various capacities as a leader as well as an individual contributor. Priya had a bachelor's degree of engineering in electronics from uh, National Institute of Technology, NIT Jamshedpur, and an MBA in international business from ICFI Hyderabad. Priya was a PMP, a uh, Prince II, ITIL, Sigma Six Belt, and, uh, and you know, the knowledge he possesses is, uh, he possessed is, you know, beyond his bio that I'm speaking of right now. So that was something about uh, one of our late members, Mr. Uh, Priya Slokarya. So now let's continue with the event. And uh, now before we start the event, I have a few housekeeping tips that you, know, you can uh, just for the well maintaining or for the well functioning of this event. So the event format is in such a way that uh, we have three speakers with us uh, here tonight. So we'll be starting with uh, Mr. Neil Pandey and his talk on introduction to GNU radio uh, series part one. So then after the first presentation is done, we'll have 15 minutes for a Q&A session. So you have a, a 45 minutes uh, presentation and then a 15 minutes Q&A where you can post your questions uh, via our Slack channel and our team will help it get conveyed to the speaker. And so after uh, the presentation is done, the speaker can take these questions in that 15 minute Q&A of after each presentation. So you are requested to you know kindly drop your questions uh, to the speaker on the Slack workspace, as I mentioned, if you're not a part of the Slack workspace, I request you to do so, um, so that you know you can interact with the community as well as ask the questions for your uh, for the presentations that we're going to have. So, uh, apart from that, also uh, we have a code of conduct for our Slack workspace, and uh, it is my humble request to all of you who are not a part of our Slack workspace to uh, stick to these. Uh, stick to these uh, code of conduct. So I'll quickly highlight a few major points that you know you can start uh, right away, which is to keep your real names. So you know you cannot uh, use something like RF at the rate one, two, three. Kindly uh, use your real name. And along with that, you can put a picture of yourself. If you're not comfortable sharing a picture, you can keep anything, but um, your name should be real. So apart from that, you know, um, we do not appreciate any kind of uh, verbal abuse, be it on any caste, religion, or any sex, or gender uh, identity and expression, or color, or anything like that. And that would result in a direct uh, ban, a permanent ban from the community workspace. And apart from that, you know, let's uh, keep it light and simple. And, you know, you can just interact with the other members of the community. 
and uh, you know create a healthy environment so once you join the slack workspace you you can find our detailed code of conduct on the event once channel so now without further ado i would like to invite uh, mr neel pandeya to uh, give his presentation of the series which is introduction to gnu radio series and today he'll be discussing us the part 1 for that gnu radio uh, radio series so uh mr neel the uh, dice is all yours thank you thank you mr apar thank you and hello everybody thank you for joining today um i'm very excited to be here for the first event uh that we have um today i'll be talking about gnu radio and introducing gnu radio this is the first of a series uh we hope that going forward we'll uh i'll be able to do a a series um on gnu radio and explore gnu radio and show different examples and use cases uh for gnu radio. Uh I'll go ahead and share my screen. I have some slides and these slides are openly available. Um we'll post them after the meeting and I'll I'll post uh in the chat in Slack where you can get the slides and the uh the flow graphs that I'll show you. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Uh and uh should be able to see the entire screen i think uh here we go let me know if that's working hopefully that's working for for everybody on the live stream yes mr new uh okay great, thank you your screen. okay super so i'll go ahead and i'll start by going through some slides and introducing gnu radio and and talking about it and then i'll uh, i'll show you some flow graphs uh running against a software radio that i have here So GNU Radio uh is an open source framework for signal processing and SDR. Uh it was founded actually further back than you might think about almost 20 years ago now by somebody named Eric Blossom. Um he was uh the founding person behind GNU Radio. He was uh, away from the project for a while but now he's back and uh and working in, and involved in it again. Um and then uh We've had some project leaders uh we've had Tom Rondeau as a project leader for a number of years and and he made a lot of contributions to GNU Radio during his time uh and now the project leader is Ben Hilburn and uh, he has also made a lot of contributions to the project. Of course there are a lot of volunteers behind GNU Radio um who make uh many 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 contributions and and really make the software what it is uh today where it's very widely used. Um Uh, GNU Radio is an open source project, so it's free to download and free to use. Um, and all of the people who are contributing to it uh, are volunteers and, and doing that openly. Um, GNU Radio is a runtime library that that sits under the hood, and there's a tool that sits on top called GRC, which I'll show you in a minute. GRC stands for the GNU Radio Companion, and it's a graphical tool. And the way GNU Radio works is you build a series of blocks and you connect them and so it's a block based data flow architecture and each block in gnu radio runs in its own thread and the collection of blocks together including the interconnections is called a flow graph and these flow graphs are are collections of blocks that are connected together that you run you can run them from the gnu radio companion tool graphically or you can even run them from the command line. I'll show you more about that in a few minutes. Uh signals that are in the flow graph at least with the USRP radio this is not a requirement of GNU radio but I'm using the USRP radio from Edis Research here in this presentation and so typically signals are normalized between minus 1.0 floating point number and plus 1.0. And the use case behind GNU Radio as a visual tool, the GRC tool is kind of similar to what you would see in MathWorks Simulink if you're familiar with using that uh or with LabVIEW uh from National Instruments. If you're familiar with those visual tools, GRC is is similar to that. Uh under the hood, GNU Radio uses C++ and Python. Um the runtime library for GNU Radio is written in C++ and your blocks if you if you want to create custom blocks you can create them using either C++ or Python. I mentioned that GNU Radio is hosted on GitHub um and so you can look at the source code and and download it, compile it. Uh it's all open and free. 
Uh, and there's a homepage for GNU Radio. It's simply gnuradio.org, uh, where you can get more information about the project. I'll talk a little bit about installation and how you would, would approach the tool and install the tool. Um, these slides uh, are written for eight, Ubuntu 1804, but uh, there, there are some newer instructions online for installing it on newer versions of Linux. And Linux is prob probably the primary platform for using GNU Radio. It's primarily developed on Linux, like a lot of these open source tools. And so using it on, on Windows can, can be more difficult. Um, for people who do want to use it on Windows, I'll talk about that in a minute. There are some, uh, some, some tools that somebody put together that make it much easier than it would otherwise be. Um, but for GNU Radio, typically what you would do is start with your Ubuntu Linux system, maybe Ubuntu 18.04 or Ubuntu 20.04, one of the long-term support releases, and, uh, and then install a bunch of dependencies. Uh, GNU Radio certainly works under Fedora and other versions of Linux as well. Um, but a lot of people, including myself in the community, use uh, Ubuntu primarily. These instructions are available. There's many different places you can find instructions for installing GNU Radio. The GNU Radio website itself uh, has a wiki, which I can bring up quickly. And I'll, I'll show you where that is. I'll bring it up in another tab, and then I'll bring up specifically the installation instructions. And this is the, the, the landing page for the wiki. There's a whole bunch of resources here, including tutorials, installation instructions, um, a perspective on what GNU Radio is and how you can get started using it, uh, and a few other things that, that I'll talk about in a minute, um, like this thing here called CGRAN. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a few minutes. These instructions here will walk you through how to install GNU Radio. Um, these are mostly geared towards uh, Linux. I think there is a, a chapter here on Windows. Um, there are a couple of other ways to install GNU Radio, either on Linux or on Windows. And, and Mac OS is supported too. And since Mac OS is, is really sort of a Unix under the hood, using it on Mac is, is similar to using it on Linux. Um, and if you are running it on Windows, there's a, a person, uh, I believe his name is Jeff uh, Neerdorf. Um, he has a GitHub page that uh, has all, all of this, um, um, all of the instructions for creating some of these things uh, located there. But what he has done is created Win, Windows binaries. So this makes it a lot easier to install GNU Radio on Windows. And you can download these binaries and simply install them. Um, uh, there are different, uh, I'll explain in a minute what the different versions are. You might see here GR. GR is often used as an abbreviation for GNU Radio. Um, let me know too if my screen, uh, the, the, the size of the text is too small. Hopefully you can all read what I'm highlighting here. Uh, but GR is an abbreviation for GNU Radio. And there's a couple of versions that are, that are used and I'll, I'll explain that too in just a minute. But there are installers for all of the current releases, 3.7, 3.8 and 3.9. Uh, 3.8, 3.9 are the two current releases. Um, and so there are Windows installers for that. Um, as I mentioned, there's uh, a GitHub page uh, that the, yes? Yes, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, can you maximize your uh, browser because the text is oh. a little so Oh, sure. Uh, or, you know, I'll zoom in here. Maybe this text is now bigger. Is that better? Yeah, that's much better. Okay, okay, great. Thanks uh, for letting me know. Um, there's a, a GitHub page. I'm, I'd like to find it and show it to you. Um, I, these are instructions that he posts on how to install GNU Radio uh, and create the installer for Windows. As you can see, there's a lot of dependencies and you can even see that in the slide here. There's a lot of dependencies, a lot of packages that are required. And in Windows, you typically will have to build these from source code. So he has instructions on how to do that using Visual Studio. Um, it's a lot of work. He put a lot of work into creating these binary installers, uh, but he also has published uh, the method that he uses to create them so you can reproduce this if you want to and, uh, and do it locally. I'm trying to find the, um, 
uh, the, the, the GitHub page. I'd like to show it to you quickly. If you Google it, you should be able to find it. And it doesn't seem I can find it quickly, but, uh, but uh, uh, you, you can look uh, uh, later. I, I, uh, yeah, I'm not finding it quickly, but there's a GitHub page that he has that, uh, that hosts all of this. But um, uh, you, can, you can access all of that from the uh, GNU Radio Wiki um, if you're using Windows. There's a second tool I should mention called Conda. And Conda is another great way to install GNU Radio on any platform, Windows, Mac, or Linux. Um, this is a really uh, good tool that's um, uh, very easy to use. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll give a, a, a shout out as well to the author, uh, Ryan Volz at the MIT Haystack Observatory in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and some of his colleagues there have worked uh, really hard to put together this Conda package uh, which makes installing these tools a lot easier, uh, really on all platforms, but certainly on Windows. And uh, it's, it's a really powerful tool, uh, which will make installing and managing your GNU Radio installation a lot easier. So I, I'll mention Conda as well. And last but not least is installing from source code, which I'll talk about just so you have some explanation about how to do that. Um, there are binary packages too in Linux that you can use to install, but um, I'll, I'll talk about that in just one minute. If you want to install from source code, we have some instructions here in these slides on how to do that. Um, and the um, Edis Research Knowledge Base also has a knowledge base article, uh, an application note that will walk you through the installation process. And I'll explain these commands uh, if you're not familiar with them uh, for the audience, uh, just at, at a high level quickly. Uh, the first command is simply to create a working folder so that everything is kept in one area. And then in that folder, we'll do a git clone. Uh, git is the source code control uh, software or method that is used for most open source software tools these days. And certainly for GNU Radio, that, that is what's used. And so uh, you can do a git clone, which basically means to make a local copy of the git repository from the server. And we'll do that recursively. Uh, we need to do that so that we can get something called Volk, V-O-L-K. It's a, a library of assembly language optimized uh, primitives or DSP routines. Um, and the Volk library is required. And so we'll, we'll clone the repository recursively so that we get the Volk library. And then we'll put the URL for the repository, which is here. And this will make a local copy in the folder, in the work area folder. And then we'll go into that folder It'll be called GNU Radio because that's the name of the repository. And then we'll use git checkout to select a particular version or tag or, or even branch of the GNU Radio software. In this case, the slide is a little bit older, so it shows version 3.7. But there are newer versions of GNU Radio, and I recommend that you use them. Uh, let me quickly show you what that looks like. If you go to the GitHub page for GNU Radio, you'll see this. And this page, again, I hope you can see the text. Uh, just let me know if you can't. I'll make it larger. If you look at this page, this is the GitHub repository for GNU Radio. And this menu here allows you to choose different branches or tags. And these tags are basically versions by, uh, I'm, I'm going to assume that maybe the audience doesn't know much about Git. So I'll just try to make it accessible to everybody and explain some things that, that maybe some of you know. Um, these tags are basically labels on specific versions or specific commits in the Git repository. And you can see from the nomenclature used here that there are different versions. And so um, there's a lot of different tags here. But the ones you're interested in are the, the recent uh, you know, current versions. And so that's um, the 3.8 series and the 3.9 series. Uh, so you see here 3.8.0.0. There are usually four digits in the version number. Um, it uses what's called a semantic versioning numbering system. And so there's four versions there. And so this is the 3.8 series. The latest one there is 3.8.3.1. Uh, and so if you're using version 3.8, I would recommend using this. Um, and more recently is 3.9. And the latest version there is this one here, 3.9.2.0. Um, the 3.10 version is not officially released yet. Uh, but 3.8 or 3.9 is the current version, and you can use that. I'm, I'm using here today with you in this uh, presentation 3.8.3. Uh, that is what I'm using. And this checkout command will select that particular version. 
Once you do that, uh, you can do make dir build that will make a directory, make a folder called build, and then you'll go into that folder. This build folder is useful because when you run something called CMake, it will put all the build products in the build folder. So it keeps it uh, organized. And CMake makes the make file. CMake will scan your system for dependencies and it will follow other rules that are defined by a file called cmakelists.txt, which is in the uh, parent folder. And that's why we do dot dot slash. Uh, we tell CMake to look in that parent folder uh, parent directory for that file, which contains all the rules and guidelines for how to build the GNU radio software. And so it will scan your system for uh, packages and particular versions of those packages. It handles all the cross platform issues and dependencies, whether you're on Mac or windows or Linux and so on. And CMake will, will look at uh, all of that and create the make file that you need. Uh, after CMake runs, uh, CMake will also, turn on or off different options. Usually there are different options that you can enable or disable when you're building something from source code like GNU Radio. And so you can also optionally add command line arguments to CMake uh, to indicate some of those options or flags and whether you want to enable them or disable them. Um, the After uh, CMake runs, it will tell you what version of the tool it's running and what, what uh, components are enabled. Um, I can show you that here, I think further back. In fact, I'll just go ahead and run it. Let me open up a new terminal window and I will go into my home directory and go into my Git folder and go into GNU radio and go into my build folder and I will run CMake again. I did this earlier, but I'll go ahead and run it again. And you can see all the output. We can look through that output. I'll explain it to you quickly just at a high level. I'll let it run to the end, it only takes a minute. And what you'll see here is output that shows you what dependencies it looked for and what features it was trying to enable based on the presence of those dependencies. And it will give you the result of that. Uh, if there's any errors along the way, it will tell you. Uh, some of these dependencies are optional, so um, it, it won't give you an error, but it'll just let you know that something was not enabled. Um, and since I didn't specify that certain things should be enabled or disabled, it will go with the default and try to enable a whole series of things. And so the output starts here up at the top. It checks your system to make sure you have certain hardware features enabled. It checks for some other required dependencies. Um, Sorry to interrupt you, uh, Mr. Okay. Neil. Yes. Uh, uh, can you, could you please uh, expand your terminal or magnify it? Sure, absolutely, yeah. Let's zoom in a little bit more. Hopefully that's a little bit better, a little larger there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Three D. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Good one. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, and so you see all the output from all of those features as it scans, like whether to enable filters or some of the the filter blocks or some of the analog blocks or digital blocks, things like that. It looks for things like the Qt library, which is a library for 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 graphics and and GUIs and and other things as well. It, so it looks and checks for Qt5, Qt version 5, even Python Qt, and, and so on, something called ALSA for the audio. Uh, all of these things it checks, and based on the results of those checks, it will enable certain components. So it will tell you what is enabled and what is disabled. In this case, my system had all the necessary components to enable all the different uh, components. So everything got enabled, all of these things here. Um, things like, like Doxygen is for documentation. Um, all of these GR dash, these are different components in GNU Radio, and they typically uh, have a name of GR dash something. And so all of these components like uh, the zero MQ blocks, if, if, you're, if you're familiar with those, uh, those are messaging blocks, kind of like a socket. Um, um, and it's a, it's a system called zero MQ, zero messaging queue. So, so in, in this case, this means that feature was enabled and so on. So all of these features here uh, were successfully enabled nothing was disabled and then it tells you uh, where it's going to put the installation that's called the installation prefix and it tells you it's putting my GNU radio installation in slash user slash local which is the default location uh, it tells me what version i'm building uh, gives give that to me in a three in, in the four octet version output and the three octet version output so it tells me what what version is being built 
And then it generates all the make files and it tells me where it put those, which is here. And so then if I look at my folder, now I already built this earlier, so there's more here than you might see uh, if you're doing this yourself at home. But um, the, the main thing is that you see here, there's a make file, this top level make file here. And so that got generated for me. And once that's done, the make J4 will then run make. Uh, it will run the make file. Um, the, if I type make, it will look for a make file and then run it. And then that will uh, ex uh, tell GCC, the compiler, uh, how to build all of the code and what order to look at the CPP, C++ files. Uh, the J4 just means uh, to use four cores and to build the code uh, in parallel. Um, my system has, uh, I think it's 10 cores. I'm on a 10 core system at the moment, so I just uh, can do J4, J6, or, or even J10, and uh, it will speed up the build process. When GCC, when, when make is done, and it takes several minutes, if you're on a slower system or a system with fewer cores, it could even take maybe 10 or 15 minutes. When that's done, you'll then run make install. And this uh, install is actually a, what they call a target for the make file, meaning uh, you're telling make to uh, install the software. And there's a whole bunch of uh, procedures that, that it knows to do uh, that are defined in the make file for how to do that. Uh, and it'll copy files to that location you saw in the output here. It tells you it's putting it in the user local folder in your prefix. And so to, to write to that folder, you have to be root. You have to be the administrator user. So I run sudo to make sure I have administrator or root privileges. And then I run sudo ldconfig. This updates the dynamic library cache uh, so that the dynamic linker can find uh, the libraries that I just installed. And if I go and look in the user local folder, I'll see some of those libraries. So if I look in lib, you can see that there are GNU radio libraries here. There's a whole bunch of them for the different components like lib GNU radio QT GUI or digital or channels or blocks or audio and so on. So all of these uh, .so files are created. SO just stands for shared object. Uh, it's like a DLL in Windows, uh, but all of those got created here. And similarly, if I look in the bin folder, you'll see all of these uh, binaries uh, created. Some of these were created from some other things, like I installed the UHD driver uh, for the USRP radio. Um, but some of these are for GNU Radio, and these all got created when I did the, the compilation, when I, when I compiled GNU Radio and built it. Uh, things like um, GR Mod Tool, um, this one here. Um, so that got created. So it looks like my GNU Radio installation is, is all set. Um, and you can test it very simply by doing something like um, GNU Radio uh, config info, and that will tell you about your installation. I'll, I'll type help here to show all the command line options. Uh, probably the most useful is print all. And this will show me all the things about my GNU Radio installation, you know, such as where it's installed. Uh, there's a .GNU Radio folder in my home directory for uh, local settings or user-specific settings. It'll tell you what version of the compiler it used, in this case, GCC, um, and things like that. So um, this, this gives me some indication that uh, GNU Radio is installed successfully. There, there's a few other things you can do to really verify that, uh, including running a basic flow graph, and we'll come to that in just a minute. Um, OK. so. I'll mention there are a few other installation methods. There's something called PyBombs, uh, and PyBombs is basically a package manager for GNU Radio. Uh, these days, I'm not sure how widely it's used or how well it's maintained, and uh, just myself, as a matter of personal preference, I don't use PyBombs very much. It, in, in some cases, it certainly makes installing GNU Radio and other components of GNU Radio, something called an out-of-tree module, um, much easier. Uh, but in some cases, when there's not a PyBomb support or, or a recipe, what they call a recipe, for a particular uh, component, uh, you, you'd have to write it yourself or something like that. And that can be a pain. Um, I, I never really uh, used PyBombs that much. And so I'm not personally much of a fan of it. I don't use it. Um, the second thing is this build GNU radio script. Uh, this isn't maintained much anymore. Um, it's from a person who's very active in the GNU radio community called Marcus Leach. Uh, but this uh, script is no longer really maintained. Um, and so uh, usually if you're going to build from source code, you'd have to follow 
instructions like the ones in these slides or the ones on the website that I showed you a moment ago, uh, somewhere over here um, on this website. You can either use Conda uh, or you could uh, follow the instructions on, on this website or on the Edis Research uh, knowledge base. There's a section for application notes and one of the application notes is for installing new radio as well as the UHD driver for for USRP radios but but also covers installing GNU radio on Linux and this document will uh, will walk you through that for different versions of Linux um, from start to finish so uh, those, those are the ways you can install GNU radio okay I'll move on to a couple of footnotes I'm gonna skip some of this these are slides that are taken from a workshop that a colleague and I created here at uh, Edis research uh, for sort of a a technical training workshop uh, that we sometimes give for uh, that covers UHD and the USRP radios uh, and GNU radio, of course. Um, so I'm, I'm going to skip some of this material that's that's not relevant right now or, or, or whatever uh, that we don't need. Um, one thing I'll mention quickly is um, some people sometimes ask, hey, can I install parallel versions of GNU radio? How do I do that? And why would I even want to do that? The, the answer is yes, you can. And it's very easy. Uh, and there's lots of good reasons for doing that, especially if you're developing code or developing a GNU radio module or a GNU radio flow graph. You, you may find, depending on what radio you're using or uh, what your workflow is, that it's it's either very useful or, or sometimes potentially necessary to install multiple versions uh, side by side. Um, that, that may or may not be true in your particular case, but there certainly are reasons to do it. Uh, and if you need to do it, it's not very difficult. When you install GNU Radio, you would simply define a different location to put your installation and keep them in different folders. Uh, you would do that from that CMake command you saw me invoke or talk about a minute ago, and you would add a command line option to the CMake command to tell it where to put the installation. And then once you have built that version and you have a series of versions uh, built in, in different folders, um, you can change between them by setting different environment variables, uh, these environment variables here. And you can make sure that they point to the correct folder. And then that version of the of GNU Radio will be used. Uh, and that's really all you have to do. These slides here will help you uh, do that and set that up. We'll walk you through that. OK, let's talk about how you can test GNU Radio once you have it installed. Um, like I said, you can run this GNU Radio config info uh, tool, as I did here in the, in the terminal window. You can look at the version, the most common command lines that you'd probably use are to check the version, uh, check the prefix, meaning the install folder, and to check which components are enabled. I'll do that quickly here just to show you what that looks like. So the version uh, reports back as 3.8.3. That's correct. That is the version I, I meant to install. The other one is prefix, so let's try that. And that tells me Everything's put under the user local folder, which is correct. Uh, we, we showed you the user local folder here. I showed you that just one minute ago. Um, and then there's the enabled components uh, option. So let me show you that. And that lists all the enabled components which match the output from CMake. Uh, and all of those components look correct. They look complete. So that looks good. Um, you could also go into Python and type import radio and if uh, import GNU radio. If you're familiar with Python, that basically will tell Python to try to include the GNU radio library. And if that's successful, um, that gives you an indication GNU radio is installed correctly because it found um, GNU radio. The first thing you can also try uh, after doing uh, these tests here is to actually run a flow graph. And one of the ones that's uh, very commonly used and it's built into GNU Radio is the dual tone multi-frequency, the DTMF flow graph. And this is a very basic flow graph that doesn't even use any radio hardware. GNU Radio doesn't have to use any hardware, in fact. It, it really is just a processing framework. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily talk to a radio uh, piece of radio hardware. Uh, and in this case, we'll create a flow graph that doesn't use any RF. It doesn't talk to a radio. It just generates tones. Uh, and in this case, we'll generate the tones from a telephone keypad, uh, a DTMF keypad, which are standardized by the ISO, uh, one of the international standards committees. I think they're based in Switzerland. And these tones are international, and, and they're defined you know, across the world. 
so that when you have a touch tone phone and you're, and you're typing those numbers, um, that a particular tone, the same tone is generated. And the tone is a summation of two tones based on the row and the column in which your number or symbol uh, appear. So if you're typing your phone number, you know, maybe double nine, double five, eight, eight, three, two, whatever your phone number might be, the tones that would get generated in the case of a nine would be four, 1,477 plus 852. So they're multi-tones, they're two-tone waveforms um, based on the row and column where your number or letter even uh, appear. I don't know why they define letters here. I've, I've never seen this myself on a phone. But uh, this, is, this is the whole definition, all 16 of these things. And uh, we'll go ahead and uh, create a flow graph, which I'll show you in just one second. Uh, and there's two ways you can run this. You can open the flow graph in the, the, uh, the GRC tool and then run it from there. But as we'll see in a minute, flow graphs are really C++ programs or Python programs. And because they're they're just programs or scripts, Python scripts or C++ code, compiled code, we can invoke them directly from the command line. And so we can type Python, and then the path, at least in this workshop that, that we have, is uh, we have a top-level folder called Edis Workshop and a folder called Flow Graphs, and then we can, we can run that. And I'll, I'll show you how we can run that both ways. And so I'll go ahead and switch over here to my GNU Radio Companion tool. The, the way you would invoke GNU Radio Companion is by simply typing GNU Radio Companion on the command line, uh, GNU Radio dash Companion. That will bring up this tool here. And this is GRC, GNU Radio Companion. And to be clear, this is not GNU Radio. GNU Radio is a runtime library. Uh, those DLL files or, or .so files that I showed you a few minutes ago on the command line. Um, but uh, this, this is a graphical tool that will build the, those flow graphs. And if I look, open the basic dial tone one under Edis Workshop's uh, flow graphs, and I look at the basic dial tone, you see here a flow graph looks like this. I mentioned that these are basically a collection of blocks, and they're connected by these, these uh, connector lines here. I'll save that flow graph quick because I just modified it. And let me explain how this works, basically. So. Um, they, there's a bunch of icons up at the top. Some of them are, are maybe self-explanatory, like create a new flow graph or save or open the flow graph or uh, delete something. Uh, the most important icons here are probably the execute flow graph. This will run the flow graph that you've drawn on the canvas. This window, this part of the window here is called the canvas. Uh, and once the flow graphs are running, you can kill it, stop it with this icon here, this uh, button here. Um, this is a tab display of all the different flow graphs you have open. Uh, this here is your canvas. Over here on the right is a library. This is the library of blocks that I have available to me. Uh, all of these blocks are the standard blocks or what are called in-tree blocks. Uh, and you can open these like this and drill down to a particular block and then highlight it and drag it over into the canvas and then drop it. And then the block is now positioned uh, on the canvas for you to use. Um, typically, most blocks will have an input or an output or maybe just one. Like in this case, the noise source just has an output. Um, in most cases, those need to be connected, not always. For example, here, the signal source has the CMD or command and freak uh, frequency inputs. Um, they're in gray and they don't need to be connected. Notice they're not connected, uh, but there's no error. So in some cases, it's okay. Some cases, it's not okay. Uh, then down below in this window, you have the terminal window echoed in the GRC window. So what you see here is what you will see here. This console window is the window from which I invoked GNU Radio Companion a few minutes ago uh, before we got started here today. And so all of the output that is shown in this command line uh, tool, this... Um, sorry, in this, in this console window, is echoed, repeated in this window here. So I can stay in the GRC window and watch what's happening as I run the flow graph and make sure that there are no errors generated or something like that. Uh, this part of the window here shows me variables. Uh, you can define variables in your flow graph. Like up here, I have a variable called samp rate or sampling rate, and it's set to 32K in this case. And so the value for that variable is shown here. So 
this is kind of like a variable watch window. Um, blocks in GNU Radio uh, have properties, and you can access those by just double clicking on the block. I'm going to remove this block, though, because it's not part of this flow graph. I only put it there as an example. Instead, I'll go here and show you the properties of the signal source block. Uh, these are tabbed. Most of the blocks have different tabs. The general tab has the most commonly used properties. So in this case, for a signal source, this block will generate a waveform, uh, maybe a cosine or a sine wave or a square wave or triangle wave. There's different choices. You can select the uh, waveform there. And then the sample rate is defined here. You can put a number. But notice here, I don't have a particular number. I have a variable. I have a, uh, a word here, a sample rate. And the reason I can do that is because I have this variable here defined. This is a block. Um, under this tab here, under variables, I can create a variable here and drop it into the canvas and then uh, uh, look at the properties of it, and I can give it a name and a value. Um, and so I've done that here. By default in GNU Radio, when you create a new flow graph, it will include one variable for the sampling rate. I'll show you. I'll go here to create a new flow graph. You see it created one for me here by default. And I'm given two blocks uh, initially, the options block and the variable block. Uh, let me go back, though. Let me close this. And I'll go back to this one. So that is my signal source. So I have two signal sources here. And they are at different frequencies. This one is 350 hertz. And this one is at 440 hertz. Uh, it turns out those are the ISO standard tones for a dial tone, which we'll hear in just one minute. I also include noise source. I do that just to make the signal, the dial tone, maybe sound a little bit more authentic. Uh, so we have a noise source to find. There are different types of noise, different distributions for noise. I'll just use a Gaussian distribution. An amplitude is given, uh, and a seed value for the number generator is given. Most blocks have sometimes advanced properties that are not always used or not always required or necessary. Uh, I won't explain these right now. Uh, and then there's a documentation tab for blocks that will uh, explain how the block is used and what all the parameters mean. Uh, this is an adder block. So as the name implies, it takes um, two or more uh, inputs and then summates them and creates an output. And so here you can define how many inputs uh, and then something called the vector length and what type the outputs are. Here they're floating point values. And what's interesting is you might have noticed these outputs and, and inputs are colored. Uh, these ones are colored gray, and these ones are colored orange. And so what does that mean? Well, the, the color indicates the data type. And you can come here to help and look at types. And the color mapping between the color and the data type are illustrated here. Um, and so these are the default mappings uh, and, and colors. And so you see the orange color that you see on the screen is a floating point value, a single precision 32-bit floating point value. Um, and that's why these inputs and outputs are all colored orange. On the signal sources, there are also two other inputs, and they're colored gray. And the gray means in a synchronous, an async message. Uh, and all that basically does is allow you to send a message to this block from another block to give it either a command to do something uh, and also to specify the frequency. Uh, but those are optional. They don't need to be connected, and, and they're not here. Uh, and then there's an audio sync block. And this is where um, the computer's uh, speaker is basically defined. Uh, GNU Radio has a concept of sources and syncs. Sources are sources of samples. So they're receivers. Um, and each uh, sync and source can be in a different domain. So you can have a file source or a, a radio, like a USRP source, uh, or a socket, a socket source, like a TCP source or UDP source. And so there are a series of sources, and there's also sinks. Sinks are where you put samples, so that's where you transmit. And so in this case, I'm doing an audio sync, which is meant to be a, um, a speaker. It's a source where I put samples in the audio domain to be played. And so you'll hear this uh, dial tone. I'll go ahead and save this flow graph here and then run it. Hopefully, you heard that. Uh, audio playing on my computer, and it was just a standard dial tone. There wasn't really any output. As you saw, it just says, uh, hit Enter to continue. Um, and, and that's pretty much it. 
Um, notice here in this flow graph, there are no radio sources being used, but that's okay. Um, the point of this flow graph, and this flow graph is included in Guinea Radio, um, is to make sure that your environment is working properly. Um, I think I only have a few minutes left for my, for my presentation today. Uh, this is just the first part of um, a series. Uh, we'll be doing many more series uh, for GNU Radio, and I'll, I'll certainly be diving deeper and exploring many more topics um, around GNU Radio and how to use it and, and create your own blocks and things like that. Um, the slides are, are posted, though, so you can look at this. I'll, I'll mention a few more things re really quickly, and then I'll stop. When I created this flow graph and ran it, uh, I mentioned that under the hood, it's really a Python program. And so I'll, I'll notice, I'll, I'll show you something really quickly here to illustrate a point. And if I look at this folder where I uh, ran that flow graph, you'll see I have a new file called, um, uh, oh, I ran it, I think, from a different folder. I ran it from Edis Workshop flow graphs. And if I look in there, you will see that I have this dial tone basic.py. And so if I look at that, I'll use a, an editor called Mousepad. And if we look at that file, it is just a Python program. I, I think the text might be small. I'll quickly try to make it larger. Um, can I do this? No, that doesn't work. Uh, edit preferences uh, window view. Uh, make this. OK, hopefully that's large enough and you can see it. Um, and all this basically is doing is uh, creating this Python script for me. The GRC tool, the GRC window, creates this automatically. Um, I'll explain it maybe more in our second uh, episode, my, my second presentation next time. But basically, it instantiates all the blocks that you saw visually here, uh, here in Python. These are all the blocks that we that we have. And then it uh, uh, creates all the connections between them. These are, these are just Python uh, method calls, Python uh, uh, functions that are uh, that are called out to make those connections. Um, and then we have um, uh, the variable. We have the samp rate variable that we defined in that block. Um, and then there's uh, two functions here for setting the sampling frequency. And then down here is the main loop, which invokes the flow graph and uh, runs the flow graph and basically waits for you to uh, press enter. This is that message you saw printed in the in the terminal window that popped up, uh, and it and it uh, waits for you to hit a key or hit the enter key, uh, which creates an exception and then stops the flow graph from running, kills the flow graph. Um, that that's uh, the explanation in a nutshell. I'll show you quickly just one more flow graph because I think I only have a few minutes left here, and uh, I'll jump ahead to an FM receiver just to sort of uh, give you a preview of what we'll talk about next time, and uh, I'll show you the basic receiver. Uh, which is this one here. Uh, I'll make my window a little bit larger so you can see that. And I'll spread these blocks out. And what we have here is a receiver that will receive commercial FM radio uh, from 88 megahertz to 108 megahertz. I'll explain this flow graph in more detail next time. But uh, basically, we have now a radio block. This block is a USRP source. So it is a source of samples from the USRP radio. And um, it's putting out these complex, that's why it's blue. The color is blue here, because these are complex IQ samples that come out and go to a filter, which will isolate one FM radio channel for me, uh, the channel that I'm interested in. Uh, and that channel will uh, be output by the filter. And, and then this wideband FM, WBFM receive block here will do the FM decoding. It will do the FM demodulation and return to me audio samples, floating point audio samples. So the input color here on this input is uh, blue, uh, and on the output it's orange. Uh, the resampler will resample that output, which has a, which uh, comes out at a, at a much higher rate, uh, and it'll it'll uh, change the sampling rate to something that my sound card can receive. Um, and so I'll put that to an audio sync and play the audio. There's a multiply const here in the middle, and all the, all that does is uh, scale the values. It's kind of like a volume control. And I have a slider. I'll create a slider widget. Uh, using the QT framework uh, that will allow me to control the amplitude of that of that audio signal, basically like a volume control. Uh, and then I also have a WAV file sync, and so it will write the audio to a WAV file, basically recording what I'm receiving. I'll go ahead and run this. Uh, do I have to save it first? Okay. 
huh, why is that not uh, running today? Huh, isn't it funny that always when you try to do this, these demo, this ran just before our event today started, but now it's not running. Uh, do I have an error? Assertion value stop failed. What? How did that happen? Did something, uh, oh, uh, the stop value needs to be higher. Okay, sure. So I'll put that to 60. Okay, let me go and save this. I must have edited something and it didn't work. Sorry about that. Okay, so now you see the output in this terminal window. Department of Public Safety. The idea is to have civilians. I'll turn the audio down for just a minute to explain this. So here, the radio was uh, um, putting some output, writing some output to the terminal window. Uh, this is from the UHD driver for the USRP radio. So a whole bunch of output is is shown here, and then uh, and then it's running. You might see when you run this, uh, you know, at home or something on your own or in your office or something like that. If you try to run the same flow graphs that I'm running here, you might see these AUs. These are audio underruns. Unless you get a lot of them, they're, they're, they're fine. They're benign. They're not a problem. If you see them streaming across the screen, that's a problem. And you usually hear that. You'll hear the audio is very choppy uh, or just simply bad or, or, or wrong. In this case, I just got one, and that's fine. And uh, what this flow graph did is it created two slider objects for changing the RF gain from the radio and the frequency that we're tuning to, the, the radio station. And then there's an audio gain for basically volume control, as I said. Uh, and then there's also an FFT display showing me the received signal. I'll turn the volume up, and you can hear the audio from this uh, station. Silence. Heron wonders, won't that just alienate the officers even more from the people they serve? There was more heat. So you can hear that that audio. I'll go ahead and try to retune that. I. I thought I put a little note to myself in one of these uh, flow graphs um, for stations that were, yeah, here it is, uh, that were strong. Um, let me try this one. I think this was a strong station. So I'll go ahead and I'll retune the radio in that text box, and let's hear what we, uh, what we find. Hopefully you're hearing all of that audio from my uh, computer. I, uh, I tuned to a couple of different frequencies that are strong, radio stations that are strong here in Austin, Texas, uh, in the United States. Um, I made a note here to myself. There's a nice block in GNU Radio for creating notes. So I created a note here to myself so I could quickly find those frequencies. And I just put them in my uh, slider widget object here, uh, which has a text box for the value. So I just put them in there and retuned. You can see the spectrum here. Um, there's other options for displaying that spectrum from this widget, like auto scale and things like that. We'll, we'll look at this more next time. I can add a grid uh, to the display, things like that. It might be hard to see, but there's a little grid here. But uh, anyway, this is the FM receiver. It's, uh, it's uh, basically doing FM receive on one station. It's not, you may know in FM that most FM uh, radio stations are stereo, uh, but this flow graph is only doing mono, uh, just doing one channel, not both of the stereo channels. Um, and there's other components in the FM signal like RDS, and uh, we're not looking at that here. Um, but maybe uh, we'll look at that next time. Um, I think I'm out of time. Uh, is that right? Yeah, I think I'm supposed to stop five minutes ago. Sorry about that. Uh, went a little bit over. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, stop the flow graph. Okay. And uh, I'll uh, stop sharing my screen and I'll just make a few other comments. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to get my, my screen back. Give me one second. Um, I'll just make a few comments that... Um, uh, like I said, I'll, I'll continue this series in future uh, SISDRUG events. Um, so we'll keep exploring GNU Radio and uh, looking at all different kinds of flow graphs, different waveforms, and, and different things you can do with GNU Radio, such as creating your own blocks and, and, and debugging flow graphs and things like that. Um, thank you for joining me today and, and watching my presentation. If you have any questions, you can reach me on Slack, on the SISDRUG Slack channel, um, or you can send me an email, my email address is uh, uh, listed in the um, uh, 
uh, on the SISDRUG website. Uh, in fact, I'll go ahead and put all of that in my um, uh, in the Slack channel, and it's also in my profile uh, on Slack on the Slack channel for the uh, SISDRUG workspace. My profile has my email address, so feel free to reach out to me, and I can show you where you can get these slides um, and download the PDF file as well as um, the flow graphs. Thank you for joining me and uh, um, uh, let me know if you have any questions. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Neil. Uh, that was a really insightful presentation. Um, so I hope that this uh, first presentation, which was uh, introduction to GNU Radio Series part one uh, by Mr. Neil Pandya would help you to you know get that initial understanding and help uh, you understand how GNU Radio Companion basically works. So if you have any questions or queries regarding to the presentation, I would request you to kindly drop those queries uh, on our Slack workspace, and uh, then we can have it uh, you know, discussed with Mr. Neil right now. So I'm just checking the Slack workspace, and it seems like there are no queries. So uh, yeah. so. If any one of you have any queries for uh, Mr. Reed, you can you know connect with him on the uh, South Indian SDR user group Slack workspace, and you know you can uh, put the questions to him or in the channel directly. So that was it for our first presentation. Now moving on to our second presentation for this event. Um, for the second presentation, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Rohan Sundar, and he's going to be speaking about introduction to ml series and this would be the first part of that ml series so uh rohan the dice is all yours uh, thank you Apar. so let me just share my screen Uh, I hope every, everyone can see my screen. Uh, yes. Yeah. OK, that's great. So hello, everyone. As I mentioned before, I'm as mentioned before, I'm Rohan. I'm a computer vision engineer at Hycotronics, which is a defense startup in Bangalore, India. So hopefully this would this is a non-mathematical introduction to machine learning since it's the first in the series. Uh, I hope to introduce you to more complex uh, methods and techniques of learning from data. Uh, OK, so my background, I currently work on real-time object detection algorithms from uh, video streams. As I mentioned before, I'm a graduate of Stony Brook University, and I've done research on high-performance computing I have also represented my university and the US at uh, the International Supercomputing Conference in 2012, where we built a green cluster uh, that uh, I think at that year made it within the top 500 among green clusters for performance per watt. Uh, anyway, so what is machine learning? So machine learning can just be summarized uh, as learning from data. So we, if, if, you, if you take a very reductionist view, human beings are kind of like machine learning agents that combine multiple forms of learning from data. So we, when, you, when we uh, engage with ourselves in the world, we have certain priors built in. That's why we can see. That's why we can understand when we were when we were children, we can understand languages and so on. But uh, this, uh, since we are dealing with computers, we can we are going to be restricted to three types of machine learning: supervised learning. This is uh, the vast majority of what you're going to be doing falls into this category, and it's extremely useful. It's extremely important to understand unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. So as I said before, uh, the most useful methods in practice tend to be versions of supervised learning called one is referred to as self-supervised learning. 
and the other is referred to as active learning. I will explain these two later. Uh, they would not be the focus of this presentation. They would be focuses. Uh, they would be the focus of uh, uh, a future presentation, hopefully. Rohan, uh, sorry to interrupt you in between. Uh, yes. Can you can you go on full screen? Can you uh, you know press F11 on your uh, uh, the slides so that you know it is much. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can you see them now? Yeah. Yes. Much better. Yeah. Much better. Okay. Anyway, let's set some goals or let's set some uh, goal posts as such. Whatever method you use, since you're learning from data, it should not memorize the data set. That is not the point of machine learning. The point of machine learning should be to generalize to data that your model has not seen. So from your limited data, your model should be able to find some approximation of the world around it, or at least the world that generates that data, right? Uh, it may, so machine learning may be inspired by bio, biology, but they are, machines are not alive. So you have to understand uh, how to set expectations in a machine learning project. If you think you're going, if you say set uh, an expectation, like uh, let's say I, I want, uh, for example, say self-driving cars. I want it to be able to navigate not only on highways, but on city roads and on Indian roads. This is not going to happen, okay? So you may be able to do highways if you, if you do it right. City roads are much harder and Indian roads are next to impossible because you're going to be dealing with a lot of other machines, a lot, a lot of machines that are alive and can exploit you in different ways. So generally speaking, machine, uh, most of these machine learning methods are useful when as part of an overall system that let's say the machine learning model makes a mistake. It doesn't affect the performance of the system. There are other ways in which your system can recuperate or make up for those mistakes. So the errors should cancel out. This is a very important part. If the errors don't, errors made by your model don't cancel out and they start exploding, uh, your uh, system is not gonna work in the real world. So ML is one part of your entire system. And in fact, in certain cases, it might be a very small part, depending on the problem. Okay, so let's get the meat and potatoes. Supervised learning. Basic introduction to supervised learning would be: I have a set of I have a set of data, and I have a set of labels. I want to find some function that first takes the data, takes your input, and matches them to the appropriate label. Okay, so how would we go about doing that? So there is something called a loss function. And this is something that, uh, Apar, is it possible for me to use the whiteboard on this? Uh, no, I think uh, whiteboard on Google Meets would take you to some another link. Uh, you can definitely try that. Uh, you can you know, stop sharing. Uh, okay. So let me just, I should have tried this earlier. Sorry. And you can uh, open in the options, whiteboard, open a jam, and then you can present that. Okay. Yeah, I'm not able to. Anyway, uh, let me just present. Continue the presentation. You, maybe you could open a text editor locally on your system or something like that. To, uh, to I needed to draw out a function. So oh, I, I see. Well, OK. Anyway, so how, you, how we would go about doing this is, OK, let's say you would have to have a very good imagination but since you have uh, the best graphics, 
uh, Rohan, can you uh, like uh, zoom out to like hundred percent because it is uh, getting okay. too big? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So since everyone has the best graphics chip in the world in their head, you'll have to imagine what I'm saying. I'm going to make it as descriptive as possible. Let's say, how do you, okay, the problem is how do you find a mapping from an input to the target label that you have already previously assigned? One way you could do that is you define, you make a prediction, you get some function, you provide the function and the beginning. Let's say it's a linear function, right? So let's say it's of the form y equals mx plus b. That's a straight line, okay? And now you want to say, first you make a prediction. You take a point, you take something from your data set, you plug it in, and let's say m is 0.5, b is 0.5, and your feature is, let's say, 2, the value of 2, for example. So that's 2 into 0.5 plus 0.5, that is 1.5 and your label is one. So you have an error of 0.5. So this is a simple calculus problem. So let's choose some sort of loss metric, right? Or loss function that would minimize this error. So I'm going to use mean square error, which means that the true, uh, true value minus my predicted value, I'm going to square it uh, and I'm going to sum that over all of them, all the data points, and then I'm going to try and minimize this error. It's a simple calculus problem. It's a quadratic function. So you know where the minimum should be. It should be at the, at the base of that parabola, right? Uh, OK, so you try to keep bringing it closer and closer. So this is a regression problem. Let's say it's a classification problem. Let's say that there are only two labels let's say you want to distinguish between dogs and cats how would you do that you could do something called binary cross, cross entropy right so i hope people know what entropy is but it's basically okay it's a so you take the probability of occurrence times the log of the probability and that's that's your entropy of the system. So you want to minimize this, meaning that you want to find some set of features from your images that would effectively help you classify into a dog or a cat. So that's, again, another calculus problems. In fact, most machine learning methods are hidden uh, are in the background. They're just optimization methods. You're just minimizing some function or maximizing some function. And in the newest deep learning methods, uh, you can have very complex loss functions. You can have an other neural network becoming be, being a loss function in of itself that has been pre-trained on a different data set and you use it anyway. Okay, so that should provide you some idea of what supervised learning is, okay? So examples are, as I said before, it's a dog, is it a cat? Or this would be a classification problem. This is a regression problem. So let's say these are house prices and these are some feature sets related to uh, features related to what I think house prices are correlated to. So I'm going to draw this regression line. And if I see a new point, I'm going to predict based on this line. I'm just going to plug that feature into this line and say, this is my expected label or this is my expected uh value right okay so unsupervised learning so supervised learning is you have a set of features you have a set of labels remove the labels and what can you say about this data set that's what unsupervised learning learning is so most of the time we would just cluster the data set so we'll see if there are uh, some of these data points uh, coming together in some way. We will define some sort of distance metric between these data points and see if they come together, okay? So you can say, uh, you can specify uh, the number of clusters and there are a number of algorithms like k-means 
I'm going to show you something called TSNE, and uh, there's another called uh, principal components analysis that would help you cluster these points. There's a deep learning version of this that is, uh, it's a form of unsupervised learning. It's called a uh, generative adversarial network that basically tries to generate new data points and another uh, neural network would tell you, okay, is this, is this a valid data point or not? So it's a form of clustering, but it's a very sophisticated form of clustering. It would help you generate very, so GANs, as you may, you may know, help generate very realistic images, realistic video. Uh, you might've heard of deep fakes and among other things. So it's, it's uh, I wouldn't say it's useful in practice, but it has very flashy results. Okay, so this is TSNE. So this is one clustering method, and the other one is PCA. Okay, so reinforcement learning is the the third paradigm of machine learning. So reinforcement learning is basically you build an environment for your machine learning model to learn from. You are not giving it labels. You are just telling the, your agent or machine learning model that it did it make a mistake or did it do well, right? So that's all you're gonna do. You're, so your entire job here is to find a proper environment and how to uh, and define the agent in such a way that it finds policies that would help it survive or win in this environment. So this is the basis behind most of the uh, quote unquote AI results that we have seen so far. That's AlphaGo, AlphaStar. Uh, AlphaGo is basically the Go playing agent that uh, Google's DeepMind uh, developed. Uh, similarly, AlphaStar that plays StarCraft. Now, the problem with reinforcement learning is that if your environment is not representative of the real world, it's not going to do very well in the real world. It will do very well in your environment. It will make for extremely uh, interesting uh, headlines, but it might not do very well in the real world. Well, one famous example of this is self-driving cars. So you can't train a self-driving car in a simulator because Humans are more com complex and humans are more willing to break the rules in a way. So it, it they tend to fail in the real world. Uh, of course, more research needs to be done on these kind of paradigms. And once they, once they, lead, uh, the, once they have a certain level of, uh, well, let's say maturity, I'm sure there will be practical applications uh, very good practical applications of reinforcement learning. But so far, uh, it's been uh, relegated to game playing, uh, maybe AI agents for video games and such, right? Of course, there are some financial applications of this, but they don't use the kind of flashy reinforcement learning uh, as an AlphaGo or AlphaStar. It's, uh, I mean, if you've heard of high frequency trading, there's some finding the right place to send your order to so that you can make a profit. But, uh, you know, those are well known, those, those are well specified problems. So you have to be able to specify your environment and reinforcement learning. Okay. So the most useful parts of ML, are like semi-supervised learning. Semi-supervised learning is a subset, as I mentioned before, of supervised learning. So what you do with semi-supervised learning is you use your data set to generate labels. Now the labels will be soft labels, right? There will be some error rate in the labels. So you have a large data set, you can generate a finite set of labels and get your model to learn from them. Learn from the labels it's generated. So for example, and these are in fact very useful out in the field. So let's say that you want to build an image classification network, right? What, and you don't have a lot of images or something. Let's say you want to be able to, I don't know, identify drones, for example. 
and you don't have a lot of images of drones. You have a few images of drones and, and you, you don't want to distinguish between different types of drones. That's another important part. Uh, let's say you just want to look up in the sky. You want to point a camera at the sky and there's a drone. That's all it should be able to do, right? So you have, say, five images of a drone. Okay, this is usually not enough to develop a good uh, model to classify drones. But what you could do is <clears throat> damage the image, right? You can add uh, a half pelt filter, so something like a pixel shift in the image. So you do you shift the image by two pixels to the right or left or something like that. That uh, simulate some sort of motion motion blur and then you tell your model recover the original image from this so in the process of recovering it it will learn features so the so your image itself is a label so you have the correct image correct quote unquote so the pixel uh, of the original image becomes the label and your damaged pixel is the feature so it tries to figure out how to fit uh, fit those pixels together, so sort of make them match. So there are a number of ways you can do this. Uh, there are certain, I mentioned certain things like, okay, so GPT-3, I'm sure people are, would have heard of. This is in the language field. This is a very large language model where you build a probabilistic model by looking at sequences of text. So let's say I have a sentence like, uh the cat drank the most obvious next word to a human being is milk so you can mask the word milk and provide this to the machine learning model and try to get it to guess it so it will learn a probability distribution of sequences based on what it's seen before and similarly there's another uh machine vision model called deep image prior that without any training data set is able to do the denoising it's able to do uh you know image in painting image in painting is basically you cut off part of the image uh, not a very significant part a small part something like 10 percent, 20 percent and you ask your model to fill in those pixels since you have the original image you can actually compare and see well has it done a good job of filling it in so in the process deep, deep image prior ends up learning what how uh, images look like in the real world. So going back to our drone example, just because you have five images does not mean that you cannot build a good classification model. If you damage it, damage those images in the right way and get your machine learning model to learn how to recover those, it is going to learn features that will help it detect drones in the wild, right? So that's why this is an extremely useful paradigm. Uh, I will not be focusing on this uh, during our, my current talk, but in the future, I will definitely be spending a lot of time on this because this is an extremely useful technique that can be used in a wide variety of uh, applications. Okay, this active learning. Active learning is more of a user experience, user interface problem. Let's say you have trained a machine learning model, right? Let's say that you want to classify cats and dogs. Okay, uh, I don't have a lot of, I have a lot of data. I have some amount of data and I've trained a somewhat decent model, right? Uh, let's say it's 80% accurate in classifying cats and dogs. Now, if you go back to the beginning of the presentation when I said that your ML model is one part of a system. So let's say your system needs, say, 95% accuracy of distinguishing between cats and dogs for something it needs to do. Maybe shoot like a Nerf dart at a dog and not a cat, right? And you want to minimize collateral damage on any cat. So what could you do to improve this? You don't have a lot of images of cats versus dogs, right? You can go to Amazon Mechanical Turk, build, uh, build a small user interface, and let the, let the machine learning model read from the stream and classify from the video stream, 
right? So if it says a cat, and let's say it's not very confident that it's a cat, maybe the validation loss is, maybe the training loss or validation loss of this classification is high. That time you send it to a human being and ask him, is this a cat or a dog? And they would be able to say, maybe there are just two buttons, dog, cat. And the person just says, okay, that's a cat. Now the model is learned, right? So it start, you start learning from these data points that it's misclassified or it's not very confident of the classification. And over a period of time, you get a very good model that is able to detect cats, that's able to distinguish between cats and dogs in varied lighting conditions, in varied, maybe it's raining, maybe your data set didn't have rain in it, but a human being is able to say, okay, that's definitely a dog or that's definitely a cat, even in rainy conditions. So over a period of time, you can build a very effective supervised learning model, right? Uh, one example I've given is tag an object and track it across multiple data streams. So once you tag an object, it should be, so this is a useful, uh, this is a very useful technique that let's say you want to track someone carrying like, uh, uh, like detecting shoplifters. They have multiple cameras in the, uh, in the supermarket and you don't have a shoplifting data set, right? So what you can do is just get someone to tag the image and then keep track of where they move. So your model only keeps track of how the object moves across different cameras, right? Over time, it will learn to do it on its own from those tags. Okay, so hopefully this works. There were some problems earlier. Uh, so now I'm going to just train a ResNet 34. I'm going to use a library called FastAI. Oh, no. OK. So I'm going to use a library called FastAI to do this. Uh, Okay, so let me give you some introduction to what this is. So FastAI is a very easy to use library. I would suggest that people go through it. The docs are very easy to read and uh, very intuitive. So the, uh, the problem with most ML packages is that you need to optimize uh, a number of non-intuitive parameters that have nothing to do with the data set. And FastAI comes with a number of defaults that will help you greatly in this process, right? So I'm going to use uh, fastai.vision, fastai.metrics. I'm going to use error rates just because I need to have some sort of classification accuracy and I need the model to learn something. So BS is the batch size. So the way this works is you can't feed an entire data set into your GPU. You need to split it up into small batches. and uh, I'm going to set a batch size of 64. Uh, you can set it lower. If you set it higher, you need a GPU with more memory. So be very careful with this. And it this is one of the parameters that you need to play with with different data sets. You, you need to set different batch sizes and see how the model performs. Okay, so this is some housekeeping. You don't need to bother about it. It's just to get this thing to work properly. Okay, uh, untar data is a uh, function in FastAI uh, data sets that will help me download a uh, data set to train on. Okay, so I'm going to download the Oxford Triple IT pet data set. So let me just give you. So this contains, uh, this is what is known as fine-grained classification, where, okay, you have dogs and cats, but you have different breeds of dogs and cats. So there are 25 different breeds here, and you need your machine learning model to distinguish between different breeds. Now, 
in 2000, I think up to 2016, this was a very hard problem to do, right? Because this is not intuitive. This is not just a binary classification. Is it a cat or is it a dog? Is it a cat and what type of cat is it? Is it a dog and what type of dog is it? So there are multiple levels involved here. So I'm gonna show you something that gets 93% accuracy with something called ResNet 34. ResNet is a deep learning model. I will explain all of this in a later uh, presentation uh, because I don't have enough time right now. Uh, okay, so this is what the data set looks like, right? So I've downloaded the data set. Uh, the, these are annotations that I need to build the labels. Uh, I'm going to get the image path. And np.randomseed here is just for uh, uh, reproducibility. I need the same uh, same accuracy across multiple runs of this because there's some amount of probabilistic uh, like when you choose the 64, uh, 64 pictures in a batch, uh, just because uh, certain batches are going to do better than others. So that will affect the final accuracy. So I need it to be reproducible so that it gets the same set of images as it picked the first time so that, you know, uh, those arbitrary parameters don't uh, tamper with the actual results. So. Image data bunch is a fast AI method. So from name RE basically means I have a regular expression over here that uh, reads from this. So I'm going to drop all of this, and I only need this part, right? So that regular expression just does that. That's it. And yeah. And it normalizes with something called ImageNet stats. So if you don't know what ImageNet is, ImageNet is a very famous computer vision data set. So ImageNet stats, basically, uh, it normalizes the image with the mean and standard deviation as you find in ImageNet. And this is important for a reason that I will mention uh, down below. Because I'm using ResNet 34, I'm not going to train this from scratch. I'm going to use a uh, ResNet model that's already been trained. So that's been trained on ImageNet. In order for me to use this model for this new data set, I need to make sure that the images have the same statistics, the same mean and standard deviation. Uh, okay, so this is just, okay, show batch rows, and so it just shows you the pictures and the labels on top, right? So as you can see, there are different breeds uh, and I think there's a cat. And yeah. So there are 37 different classes between cats and dogs, right? All of them are cats and dogs. So there are 37 different classes here. So let's train this model. So ResNet 34 is a, what we would refer to as a deep learning model. So it's made of the same set, same basic block. Right? You have a convolutional 2D layer. I will explain this later. Uh, you have something called a batch norm that is, that's going to take, when you have an incoming batch, it's going to take the average and standard deviation of that batch and apply it across the features so that the features are also normalized. Otherwise, you might have certain features that are extremely large values. And when they're extremely large values, they will skew the results one way or the other. And they and they might fire uh, incessantly, meaning that they might um, they might get activated much more often. Okay. So we have something called a max uh, relu. So relu is a is an activation function. So it's basically like a linear threshold. So if you have anything above zero uh, you can say that ReLU basically takes uh, a line, a 45 degree line. It maps it to a 45 degree line. If it's anything below zero, it just discards it. Okay. So this is all you need to do deep learning. You need a few matrix transformations and uh, an activation function so that it discards certain features. That's about it. So, and then you get what is this max pool 2D? 
So max pool 2D is basically trying to do some dimensionality reduction, meaning that if you have, uh, let's say, over time, this will become a very large uh, matrix. So you need to reduce the size of this and in order to uh, one, train the model and two, to have better accuracy. So what Maxpool 2D does is it takes a small square. Uh, so a small matrix, I, I really need the, uh, okay, so anyway. Uh, okay, I'll explain this later. I think that would be better. So, okay, so this is where I'm going to train this model, right? So this is uh, this is called a one cycle fit. I'm not going to use any of the standard uh, optimizers like Adam, or I think some people would have heard of Adam, and there would be some standard optimizers within things like Keras or PyTorch. I'm not using that. I'm going to try and and let it discover learning rate for this data set so that it's able to do this classification. Okay. So this will take about five minutes or so. So let me explain. So this is a training loss. Training loss is basically, I'm using something called uh, cross entropy loss because this is a multi-class classification. Uh, you just want this to keep going down. I'm just training this for four cycles, right? Four epochs. So this is a validation loss. And already you can see that it's 90% accurate in this very hard problem, okay? so. This is an easy way for you to get started is download a pre-built model and just uh, run it on your data set, provided you keep the same uh, you know, uh, mean and standard deviation as it was trained on. So now we get 91% accuracy and so on and so forth. So we've already got a very good model without doing anything. There are a number of tricks to actually increase this accuracy so that it's uh, close to 99% accurate in classifying different uh, dog and cat breeds. But this is, uh, so this is a general class of models that I will talk about in depth, maybe in a later presentation because I don't think I have time right now. Uh, so once this finishes, uh, if anyone has any questions so far, uh, maybe you can open it up. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rohan. Uh, it was a great presentation and I hope it uh, serves as an introduction uh, to someone who is learning ML uh, quite new. So uh, guys, that was the introduction to ML series part one by uh, Rohan Sundar. So if you have any questions or queries, feel free to contact uh, Rohan or drop in any of the uh, 
or in any of our slack workspace channels and you know so you can contact me on the slack workspace and i will add my email uh, to the slides thank you Rohan. thank you so much okay. uh, so so for our next presentation uh, tonight and this is going to be our final presentation i would like to invite uh, dr selvin lefeu uh, if i'm pronouncing it correctly Hello. Hello, Dr. Selvain. C can you hear me? Is it working? Yeah, it, yeah it's working. <laughs> Excellent. OK, sounds good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so uh, so uh, Dr. Selvain is going to present uh, his presentation, which is going to be on Slice, a language for hard coding algorithms into FPGA hardware. So something before we start, something about Dr. Selvain. He's a senior researcher at Inferior France, where he leads the MFX team. His main research focus is on algorithms and data structures for geometry modeling, processing, and synthesis in context of additive manufacturing. Sylvain received the Eurographics Young Research Award in 2010. From 2012 to 2017, he was the principal investigator of the ERC Shape Forge and ICE. Projects. He created and is the lead developer of the ICE SL software for additive manufacturing. Sylvain is now investigating the use of FPGA architectures in the context of his research and created the Slice language for this purpose. We are very glad to have you, Dr. Sylvain, uh, for our first event of the SIS DRUG. So the stage is all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, so I hope you can uh, hear me well and see my slides. If you can just yes. quickly confirm. Excellent. Yes. That's good. So thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here today. This is actually my, my first uh, talk about uh, CDs in particular. And so I'm, I'm very glad to have the opportunity to, to tell you more uh, about it. And I hope, uh, of course, that uh, you'll find it useful. Um, so uh, yes, you, you already said a, a few words about me. So basically, I just wanted to uh, point out that uh, you know my, my main area of expertise is in computer graphics <clears throat> and additive manufacturing, that's 3D printing. And so uh, I'm uh, first and foremost an expert in image and geometry processing, uh, and uh, also in uh, GPU, right? So I've been using GPUs uh, since 20 years, basically since they, they became available. Um, however, I am quite new to FPGAs, right? So uh, I've been, you know, I mean, of course, I was aware of their existence and, and more or less what they do, but I really uh, dove into the topic since basically two years ago, right? So uh, please bear with me if uh, I don't use the right terminology or if you see some um, uh, issues in, in, in the way I present that. And, uh, you know, of course, I'm, I'm welcoming feedback and suggestions on that. Um, all right. So today um, I have basically three goals, right? So I will first try to explain to you why I'm doing CDs and uh, what, what are my goals with it. Um, I will try to give you a flavor of the language and the kind of things you can do with it. It's always a bit difficult right, in a, in a, in a short time, but I will att attempt to do that. And then, of course, I will uh, try to give you a one project walkthrough. And I selected a project that uh, hopefully is, is both simple enough and, and is of interest to you. And we're, we're going to try to generate sound using these speakers uh, here and a small um, uh, digital to um, uh, analog uh, boards that we'll plug into a, a small FPGA here, right? So we'll look at the code and, and try to make it work. Um, so of course, CILIS is about programming FPGAs or designing uh, for FPGAs. Uh, I think you are all familiar with FPGAs, so I'm just going to you know, give you a, a, a very brief uh, description of that. So basically, an FPGA is uh, a reconfigurable hardware, which is made of three different very important things. The first one are the lookup tables. And these are uh, things you can configure to implement different uh, logics. So, you know, AND gates, OR gates, XOR gates, and so on. Um, then it's composed of a programmable interconnect, which so that you can describe how these different gates are connected together. And again, this is configurable through the bit streams that you send to the uh, FPGA for configuring, configuring it. And then the third components are flip flops, which are usually integrated in these logic elements. And the flip flops are using the clock. Uh, of the uh, design as input, and they act, uh, let's say, as little memories by allowing you to copy their input to their output on every uh, clock positive edge. 
right? And so the other component, of course, that is very important are the input and outputs of the, EPG, of the FPGA, because that's how you know they receive information and uh, and put information into the world uh, in the end. All right. And so the question is, how do you describe hardware for FPGAs? Um, there are, you know, to summarize quickly, two options, right? One option is to use the hardware description language, which are fairly low level. Uh, you're not directly manipulating the FPGA bitstream, but you are uh, describing things at a very uh, fine grain compared to the hardware. Uh, or uh, the other option is to use high level synthesis languages. And the idea of these things is really to, you know, go from a, a high level language, let's say C or Python or even MATLAB, and to generate the hardware design from this high level description and dealing with, you know, a very high level abstraction. abstraction and automating most of the uh, uh, design process. So that's very promising. It's also extremely uh, difficult. There's a lot of active research being done. There are tools available. But this is not what CILIS is about. In fact, CILIS is way to the left of the spectrum and very close to Verilog. Um, in fact, when I started CILIS, my initial intent was really to mostly provide quality of life improvements. This is a term that comes from, from video games. So if you're a gamer, you're familiar with it. And you know, it's all these little things you can do to make things easier. And you know, there are several things I wanted to definitely make easier uh, from Verilog, and hopefully this, this you will see in, in the syntax later on. The second objective I had is I, I wanted to be able to describe fairly complex algorithms uh, on my FPGAs. And, and to do that, uh, I thought it would be nice to be able to prototype using a standard control flow approach, you know, with while, for loops, breaks, calls, and, and subroutines, so that it's it's a bit more familiar. And, you know, my idea is once you have this proof of concept, once it runs into hardware, then you can refine and turn it into a more efficient design using more typical hardware design approaches. Or maybe it's just fine because you have enough resources to spare, or maybe it's a less critical part of the design and it's actually okay to keep this description. But the third objective, which is underlying everything else, is really I don't want to give up uh, the uh, direct understanding of how hardware resources uh, are being used. And this is where CBIS really is not an HLS and is much closer to uh, Verilog and VHDL. Because I want to understand how my cycles are used. I want clock domains to be completely exposed. I want control over which inputs and what outputs are registered, uh, over the number of flip-flops that are going to be used, and so on and so forth. So you can actually design hardware in CDs in a way that is very similar to Verilog and VHDL, just you also benefit from the other uh, quality of life improvements. And that's very important to me because I, I want the hardcore experience of designing hardware. Um, CDs is not just a language. It's also about an environment. Um, so I'm, I'm working very hard to make sure that when you start with CDs, you already can use all your you know favorite uh, FPGA, so for instance, the Ice Stick, which is a great uh, low cost board, but also the Icebreakers is a very nice Ice 40 uh, UP5K um, uh, FPGA on it. Uh, or, you know, the uh, U ULX 3S, which is a, a, a much bigger board, very nice with uh, SD RAM and, uh, you know, SD card and tons of features. Or even a DO10 Nano, right, which is a, a much bigger um, uh, Cyclone 5. Uh, FPGA board, right? That you can that you can get, and it's very powerful. And all of that you can actually address from CDs. It comes with uh, uh, what I call frameworks for each of these boards. It also comes with simulation, so you can run Icarus and Verilator simulation. This is powered by Idealize, which allows to abstract a little bit of these uh, various things. CDs also comes with uh, ready to use uh, ready to use components. Uh, which means that uh, you know right from the start you can uh, generate uh, VGA signals, you can uh, uh, talk to SDRAMs, you can do UART, OLED, and, and and so on and so forth. And there are also external contributors adding more and more. And so we we like this you know base is growing uh, steadily so that you can really get started quite easily. Okay, so uh, let's uh, dive a little bit into details now and let's see how you actually uh, design things in CDs. So the first class citizen in CILIS is the algorithm. Uh, you are writing algorithms, and algorithms are to CILIS what modules are to Verilog, basically. Uh, the first algorithm you have to write in every CILIS design is the main algorithm. And so this main algorithm, uh, I hope, can you see my mouse cursor, by the way, if I highlight something? Yes. 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 Excellent, that's good. So 
the main algorithm is going to take uh, some outputs and possibly some inputs, and these are typically pins on your FPGA. So here, for instance, the design is outputting eight uh, bits, eight pins, which are going to the LEDs on the board. Most of these boards have small LEDs, so that's one convenient thing to do. Um, then we have a 24 bits counter here, initialized to zero, and then we enter an infinite loop. You know, we don't need to stop, right? This is hardware, so as long as there's power, it's going to run. We enter this infinite loop, we increment the counter, and we output the eight most significant bits of the counter into the uh, LEDs uh, pins, which will, of course, implement a blinky, right? So we'll just be counting, uh, and we have a bit, eight bit counter on the bits of the LEDs, all right? There are simpler ways, or let's say more efficient ways to write that in CDs, but this is just a, a first implementation that, that works very well. So the main algorithm is always instanced by default. Uh, and it will uh, be directly wired into the FPGA and, 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 and will be the one running, okay? So this becomes a circuit, right? So you have to remember that every time we write any code, this becomes a circuit on the FPGA. All right. And how do you turn this thing into something running on, on, on your FPGA? Well, the first thing to do is to plug uh, the uh, FPGA into uh, your USB port for programming it. Then let me try to put the window here. Hopefully you see that. You simply go to the uh, project directory, and then you do make name of the board. So this board is called the iStick. So I just do make iStick. And then this uh, triggers the entire build system, which calls the entire software stack. So that's uh, Yosis, then next PNR, and then the uh, uh, programming tool for the FPGA. Hopefully, you can see the blinker here. And we've just did our first you know, program in, in CDs, and we uh, implemented it on the FPG. So that's as simple as it gets. Um, and of course, you can add your own boards if they're not already supported by CDs. It's, it's very easy to do. All right. So let's uh, describe a little bit more uh, the structure of an algorithm in CDs. So an algorithm is mainly composed of four things, and each of these things are actually optional. So the first things are declarations. This is where, for instance, you declare your variables. Here it's a 32 bits unsigned integer, which is initialized to zero. I will uh, describe that a little bit more uh, next slide. Then you can have two different always blocks, the always before and the always after. And what before and after refers to is the timing with respect to the state machine, which is here. So always before is done every cycle before any of the states in the state machine. Always after is done at each cycle and after any active state in the state machine. Right? And then, of course, you can have the state machine, which is using uh, the uh, uh, standard control flow syntax here, uh, while one, this is to wait one cycle, and this is uh, you know if else, and we can break out of the loop if we want to. Um, in this case, it doesn't. It, it would terminate the design, and, and then the uh, FPGA would, would remain in the last state it was uh, in. All right. Um, a few words on uh, the variable declarations. So this is you know signedness, whether it's inside or not. Then int. Uh, and then uh, the bandwidth, and basically see this only as uh, integers, right? Uh, words, if you want to do anything else, floats or, or whatever, you have to implement everything yourself. And actually, uh, one external contributor, uh, Rob ng 15 did uh, one uh, library for floating points, which has just been integrated into the, the main trunk of CDs. Um, then you have to initialize your variables. So you have to give them a value, a constant, or you have to write in full letters uninitialized. And this comes from my programming experience. I, I really dislike the fact that you can have you know, variables which are not initialized. So if you want to do that, you have to write it yourself. Why would you like to do it? To save a little bit of hardware resources if you're trying to, you know, if you're doing what we called LUT golfing, where you try to reduce the hardware as much as possible. And here you can see some examples. Um, and the last one is a bit different because these uh, initializations, when you use the equal sign, they are done every time you reset the design. So for instance, uh, by default on the ULX3S, uh, pressing this button here will trigger a reset, and this is done uh, in the CDIS framework. And so every time you press this button, it will reset the algorithm, reset the variables, and restart the uh, main algorithm from its initial state. But there is a different type of initialization, which is a power-up initialization, and this occurs every time the FPGA is configured. So either when you power it up or when you send a new uh, bit stream to the FPGA then this initialization occurs, but it's not impacted by the reset. It saves a little bit of hardware resources. It can be useful in some circumstances uh, as well. All right, so let's 
implement an algorithm and, and talk a little bit on how we can use it. So I'm going to implement an algorithm which is not main. And this is the increment algorithm. And it does, of course, only one thing. It increments uh, its input and, and you know, place that on the output. So the input um, is called old, and the output is called new. And new is old plus one. All right? And so um, you could have, of course, different inputs, uh, outputs. And here, this algorithm is implemented in a way that it has a single state. And the state is the state where the algorithm executes new equals old plus one. Still, this is an algorithm that needs to run. So we need to start it. And it has also, which means it has also, uh, uh, you know, not started state and the termination state uh, that is implicit because it has a single uh, equal state here. Um, and how do we use that? Well, we have to first instantiate the algorithm into the main. The reason is because, remember, this is hardware. So when you do an algorithm, when you define it, you are creating a blueprint of a circuit. When you instantiate the algorithm, you are actually saying, OK, now I want this to become an actual circuit on my FPGA. And I'm going to use it. The main algorithm is instantiated by default always, so you don't have to do it. But everything else has to be instantiated. And then here, you can see a call to this algorithm. So what happens here is that we are setting inputs to the algorithm instance. So here, it means that uh, old will get the value 10 through this call. And then we are waiting for the algorithm to complete to receive the value in V. And here, we'll get the new value in V. And then we display the result. And by the way, display is the equivalent of dollar display in Verilog. This only uh, is used in a simulation right now. And so in hardware, it's going to be uh, ignored. But if I do make Verilator uh, in my uh, command line, I will see the correct result, which is 11 in this case. All right? So how long does it take to make this call? It takes actually three cycles. The first cycle is the startup, because when we make the call, the main algorithm is uh, pulsing um, uh, a bit saying uh, the algorithm has to start. And then the algorithm starts on the next cycle, and it executes uh, its, its, its one state, which is new equals old plus one. This is the exact cycle. And then we need a third cycle, because we are waiting for the answer. And this wait here, which is a general wait, because main doesn't know how long the algorithm will take, it also takes at least one cycle. So that's three cycles to make this call. Uh, and then, of course, if the algorithm was, uh, you know, five cycles, it would be seven cycles in total, right? So that's two more cycles when the, than what the algorithm takes. All right, so there's a different way to call an algorithm that I actually prefer, and it's to use what I call the dot syntax. It's exactly the same as before, but now, instead of setting the parameters in the call, we are actually setting it before. So we can say inc.old equals 10, and this is setting 10 to the input called old of the inc instance of the in, uh, increment algorithm. Then we make the call, and then we can address the result by doing inc.new, right? So it's it's what I like about it is that you have named accesses to the input and outputs. Uh, it doesn't take any longer, because in fact, setting 10 into the input and doing the call triggering the algorithm is all done in the same cycle, right? And there are precise rules regarding that in, in CDs. I don't have time to go through all of that. But um, if you if you want to know more, please uh, ask me afterwards, or, or of course, refer to the documentation where this is all described. All right. So now let's look back at this algorithm. I said this algorithm has a single state, which is new equals old plus one. But because it's an algorithm that has to be called, it also means it has this you know, initial state and termination state. And that's a bit sad, right? Because clearly, this algorithm can execute in one cycle. So why do we need to do these other states? States, And indeed, we can turn that into a different type of algorithm, which is an algorithm without any states that uses an always block. And we can do that because this is a single cycle uh, thing that we're describing here. We're describing a circuit to do plus one. This can be done in a single cycle. And so we can put that into an always block. Now, this algorithm no longer needs to be called. It no longer needs to be started because it's always running, right? And as you know, if you're doing hardware, there's no such thing as not doing something, right? You can ignore the output of something, but you cannot not do something because this thing is a circuit that is wired into the FPGA. So it's going to be not anyway. So we might as well do it all the time and selectively consider the uh, output of that. All right, so let's see how we can use that now from main. We still need, of course, to instantiate the algorithm. Then we can set up the input to the algorithm by using doing inc.old equals 10. And then we know that because this algorithm is constantly running, 
we know that one cycle later we'll have the result. So we wait one cycle using the uh, step operator of CVS, and this basically is saying, okay, I want to wait one cycle, and then we know the result is valid, right? So if you know exactly the number of cycles your algorithm can take, you can also simply wait using the, the step operator, one or multiple of them, to wait for the algorithm to be done. All right? And then there's something else we can do. We can chain multiple of these algorithms. So I know my algorithm is always running. It's still the same. And then what I'm doing here is I'm creating a variable, which is an intermediate variable. And I, I use two instances of the algorithm. So increment inc1 and increment inc2. So now I have two different uh, adders, which means I have duplicated this uh, adder circuit. Right? Um, and what I do here is that I bind the output of the first instance to this variable vt. And then I bind the same variable to the input of the second instance. So by doing that, I'm wiring the circuits together. And I'm creating a flow of information between the output of inc1 and the input of inc2. Right? So it will go this way. And so that means that from now on, when I set the input of, when I change the value, I should say, of inc old, this gets into the algorithm, new gets updated, it gets into vt, immediately it gets into uh, old of inc2, and then when I look at inc2.new after two cycles, that's the time for this to propagate, I get the result, which is 12 in this case, right? So that's how you can chain algorithms together, and of course this reflects the way you are uh, chaining modules in uh, Verilog. And so hopefully you can see that you have a lot of flexibility in these different syntaxes to uh, create interesting constructs from these algorithms. Yes, and these operators are very important. They are called the wiring operators, and they, they are used uh, here. There's also a, a second variant of this one here in particular. So this one has one colon. There is a variant with two colons, and this is to tell, to refer either to the variable as it is uh, modified in the current cycle or to the variable as it was at the start of the cycle. And this is important for you know latency and registering inputs, outputs, and so on. I won't dive into the details, but uh, I have a slide uh, ready at the end if you want to know more about this. All right, another thing that I, that I really like uh, in CVS are the groups and interfaces. Um, and so the idea is actually quite simple, right? A, a group is simply a way to bundle variables together. So here I'm creating a group, it's called SDRAM, R16W16IO, that's because this is a group that is meant to be used with a, an SDRAM controller. Inside, you will find a list of variables, so the address, uh, the data coming in, the data coming out, uh, and all these are initialized with a default value because, again, everything in CVS is always initialized with some default somewhere, all right? Um, and how do you use this group? Well, you simply create the group as you would have declared a variable, right? So here, I'm creating this group of variables, uh, and it's called uh, SIO, and then I can refer to any member of the group by doing SIO.RW, SIO.ADDR, and so on and so forth, as if these were individual variables, but these variables are groups. And the big interest in doing that is that when you give the group to the SDRAM controller, it's a single line, right? You just do SD, which is on the, um, which is an input to the, uh, well, it's actually an interface because it has both input and outputs to the SDRAM controller, and you bind it using the special syntax uh, directly to SIO, right? So it makes things super easy in terms of assembling a complex design from you know processors, controllers, arbiters, whatnot, and then it's one-liners every time to uh, uh, give this uh, to pass around these groups. Um, so to bind an algorithm to a group, you need to define an interface, and here, for instance, these are the interfaces for this group. Uh, this is the interface for uh, an algorithm that uses the SDRAM interface. And so that's why, that's why the uh, address, for instance, is an output, because as a user, you tell the controller which address you are referring to. And uh, your input is, for instance, the data coming out from the uh, memory controller. And if you are writing the memory controller, you define a SDRAM provider interface, which is basically using the same group, but it, it has the opposite view where you have inputs and outputs, right? Um, and the uh, way you use that, again, in the algorithm is simply by saying, oh, I want to use the interface now, so SDRAM provider. You see, this is not input-output. This is the interface and the name of the interface. 
And then from inside the algorithm, you can do sd dot uh, data root or sd dot none and so on and so forth. Um, and again, the way the algorithm is, is called is through a binding. And here the binding is mandatory, a binding to the group that was defined here. All right. Um, what's really interesting, and maybe you can already uh, see that, is here I didn't specify the width of anything. The width is in the group, which means it's actually resolved when you do the instantiation here from the user, right? So there is a degree of genericity. And in particular, if I have two different groups for uh, an SDRAM, let's say an SDRAM which has a, a data width of 16 uh, symmetric, or one that has eight bits when you write and 128 bits when you read, well, these two groups will actually use the same interface. Uh, and for instance, if you write the SDRAM uh, arbiter, you write a single arbiter, and then depending on how the user is using it, depending on which groups the user binds to this arbiter, everything will get resolved automatically by CDs. So this degree of genericity really makes things quite easy and comfortable uh, when you write uh, memory controllers, IO interfaces, uh, and so on. You can also use that uh, for other things like, you know, I'm doing a lot of graphics, so if I have vertex coordinates, I can do a group called coordinates with X and Y fields and so on uh, and so forth. So it's, it's very convenient. Oh yes, and partial matches are also allowed. So you can define a group that has more entries than the interface. And then, you know, you can bind half of the group to one algorithm, half the other half to another algorithm because they deal with different parts. This is also allowed. Uh, and I'm planning on, on more um, flexibility even in the, in the future regarding this. All right, CDS also has uh, native support for BRAMs. Uh, that means that if you want to declare a BRAM, so remember a BRAM is a special block in uh, an FPGA, which is implementing uh, uh, some very fast memory. And the really cool thing is that you can, uh, you know, set up the address with one cycle and immediately get the data. So it's much faster than let's say SDRAM or DDR or anything like that. Uh, and the way you create a BRAM is by saying, you know, BRAM, then the type of data you store in the BRAM, the name, the size, which is optional because this might be defined by the initializer. So you, you could just use the brackets like this without any number, but here I specified it. And then you can provide some initialization. So here I say one, two, three, four, and the rest I don't care, so I just pad to zero. Well, I pad to zero, which means I care that it is zero, otherwise I could pad to uninitialized to say I really don't care, which might lead to you know, a more efficient synthesis in the initialization step. Um, and how do you use it? Well, uh, in one cycle here, I'm setting up the address. I'm saying I want to write, I enable write, and then I put some data to write, which is a 32 bits hexadecimal uh, value. Uh, and I have to wait one cycle for this to be done by the VRAM because the VRAM takes one cycle. So I wait one cycle and then I can start a read, uh, a read algorithm where I say, okay, now I want to read. I set up the address was already zero here. And then for the 16 first, first addresses, I'm going to display the value and I will increment the address. And because I'm running in simulation, when this terminates, the simulation will actually terminate and I will get the output that I see here on the right. You can see that the first value is indeed set to uh, what I wrote in the address zero, right? And so it, it's very convenient to use BRAMs. And of course, BRAMs are defining interfaces that you can give as the input of an algorithm. Uh, I might be able to show you an, an, an example of that if I have enough time. Uh, yes, and of course, this was just uh, repeating what I just said. All right, so we've already touched upon quite a few concepts. Uh, I know it's already a lot. There's a lot more, so but I, I don't want to overwhelm you with details. Um, and I encourage you to read through the project because now you should have just enough to be able to understand most uh, other projects. And otherwise, uh, you can refer to this URL where you have uh, the, all, every, all the material to start learning CDs. It will expand, but there's uh, already uh, like you know a few tutorials, the documentation, and, and a number of things. All right, let's talk about this particular example. So, what we are going to do is to uh, interface a small uh, digital to analog board. So it's a PCM five one zero two component, which is on this little breakout board. I think it's a bit dark. I don't know if you can see it. Um, and you know, it's plugged to the uh, audio jack here, which is linked to the speakers. I will plug the board onto my FPGA. So let me first unplug it from USB. I have just to be a bit careful. So it's it's plugging into the P mode here, right? And then I will plug that together. And when we'll program it, we should be able to hear some sound. Uh, it's not going to be a very beautiful sound. It's a 366 
Earth sound, and hopefully it will be clear why in a, in a minute. Okay, so I'm going into the project, make a stick, then it's gonna synthesize. It's very fast because it's a super small design. I think it's less than a hundred uh, lutz, probably even a bit smaller. And maybe you can hear that, right? Okay, so we have the sound. So it's, it seems it's working fine. I will unplug it because the sound is not very uh, nice to hear. And then I will give you a quick tour. I don't know how exactly I'm doing on time. I'm probably starting to reach 30 minutes. Uh, yes, Dr. Silvin, you still have 15 minutes. I have 15 more minutes. Yeah. Excellent. That's plenty of time then. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, all right. So let's dive into this example in more details, right? So uh, this is the code that is in um, in uh, projects, right? So let me show you the, the tree here in projects. This is the CVS uh, public repository and uh, I2S audio, right? And so if we look at this, the first thing you will notice is something I haven't talked about yet, which is preprocessor code. All right. So every line that starts with dollar dollar is a line that that uh, is given to the preprocessor, and the preprocessor, as you know, it takes this and it rewrites the source code, removing this and replacing it by what what you ask it to do. The reason we have this preprocessor code is because we need to generate a specific frequency for the pins of this uh, uh, little device here, right? So it needs two clocks. This device, it, this device. It needs a serial bit clock and it needs an audio clock. The audio clock, it will run at the frequency of our audio signal. Here, we hope to reach 44.1 Hertz as the, um, as the uh, kilohertz, sorry, as the audio signal. Uh, and then the, the bit clock will depend on this. So the bit clock has to be 64 times the frequency of the audio clock. Why? Because we're sending 32 bits for the right channel followed by 32 bits to the left channel. So that's 64 bits during one period of the audio signal. And so all of this preprocessor code is actually computing uh, the, the, uh, the value of a counter that we uh, need in order to know how many counts we should do at the 12 megahertz of the FPGA to generate the clock of the uh, audio signal and the clock of the serial, um, the serial bit communication, all right? So the base frequency, the audio frequency, you can see I used 44.1, this is in kilohertz, this one is in megahertz. And then we um, compute the bit H period count variable, which is a preprocessor variable, which is this number of times we need to count. I think it's actually six for this particular configuration. So we only need to count to six, to so six cycles of the FPGA to generate half a period of the uh, bit uh, signal. All right, and so this is all done by the preprocessor. That's one of the big advantages of having the preprocessor, and it even outputs uh, some information uh, for you to so that you can double check. Right? Um, it also computes, but I will come back to that later. The frequency of the sound we will hear uh, later. Now this is the main algorithm. So here's something interesting going on. Um, before I add the, let me zoom on this so that you can easily read it. So we have five LEDs, and indeed, that's because I know this is specialized to the ASTIC, and I know I have five LEDs on this board. So that's why you have a UINT5 LEDs here. And then we have a P-mode connector, and the P-mode connector can be both input and output. That's why it's using an in-out uh, instead of just input or output, because it can be both, and this can be configured from the design, all right? Then I have four uh, bit signals, UINT1, so that's unsigned int, one bit, and these four things are going to be used to generate the the pins for the uh, for the little device here, right? So I have four different pins to generate. Um, so the first one I'm actually not using because this thing is smart enough to generate its own uh, system clock, so I'm not generating it. It, it will be kept low. Uh, the two other ones are the bit clock and the audio clock, and the last one is the data pin, so that's the one that is sampled on the bit clock by the device to get the uh, values for the audio signal, right? Because of course you're sending digital to this, I should have started by saying that. You're sending digital signals to this and it converts it into the analog signal for the audio. All right, this is the data uh, we will send for left and then for right. And this is a counter and a modulo 32 that, will we, that we use to generate the clocks, right? So the counter is only 
three bits because, like I said, we only need to count up to six, right? So I fix this value here. Of course, I could have written, you know, something here so that the preprocessor generates uh, this value uh, on its own. I should have done that, but uh, I haven't yet. So that's uh, to, to do in the future. And then the modulo 32 is initialized to one. And what will happen, and we can actually see it here. Let me go down. If you look at this line here, what this does is that on the negative edge of the bit serial clock, it will shift the modulo 32 by one bit. So this thing goes from one to two to four to eight, or it's like, you know, one zero, one zero zero, one zero zero, and so on. And it's just um, a, 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 a single bit that goes around like this, okay? And how do I know that? Because if you look at the concatenation that occurs here, this is the concatenation syntax, same as in Verilog. And this is saying I put at the most significant bit one bit starting from zero. So this is the least significant bit that wraps back to become the most significant bit. And these are the other 31 bits, so that's 31 bits starting from bit one that are shifted to uh, towards uh, the right, okay? And so this really just creates this cyclic one bit going around, okay? And the reason we do that is because we need to count, like I said, we have the audio signal and you know when it's low, we have to send 32 bits for the right channel. When it's high, we have to send 32 bits for the uh, left channel. And we need to know when this is done. And we know this is done when we reach, when the bit, the lowest bit, the least significant bit of this variable is to one, right? So when it's one, we know we have counted 32 uh, bit cycles of the bit clock. I hope it's clear, right? It's not super simple to explain, um, um, but that's really a simple trick that we do often, right? And then the counter is used to do to do the clock and not here. The counter is counting half a period of the bit signal because you know the bit signal is low. When this counter reaches uh, this uh, value, we generate we flip to one, and when it reaches again this value, we flip to zero, and so on and so forth. And that's how we generate the bit signal. All right, and this here between dollars will be replaced by the preprocessor by the actual value. And actually, we can we can look at that because I can look at the uh, preprocessor output, which is this file generated by the preprocessor called .is.lpp. If I look inside, I can see the actual code out of the preprocessor. And here I can see that the value has been replaced in this case by three, right? So that's because the count is actually only counting the half period, uh, which so probably I, I got wrong in the value. I told you six is probably not six. Anyway, so that's replaced here and it becomes three. All right. Is it clear so far? Please let me know if you if you want me to re-explain really a part. Uh, it's fine so far. It's fine so far? Yeah. Okay. So bottom line, these two things are used to count and to uh, generate the counts that are used to generate the clocks. The clocks are actually generated here, right? But let me step back a little. Let's go back to the overall structure of the algorithm, right? So we have main, we have the LEDs, we have the P mode, we have declared the different variables. Now, the other thing we do in the declaration section is we create and initialize the uh, a, a BRAM. It's actually a BROM because we never write into it. So we can use a BROM so that we have a, a slightly smaller uh, hardware. And what happens here is that we, we want to generate a, one period of a sine wave, right? Because this is the actual data that we send to the uh, DAC so that it generates a, a sinusoidal pure tone uh, of some frequency, right? So we want to store uh, signed integer 16 bits into this wave table. And in order to generate it, I don't want to hard code the sine wave, right? What I do again, I use the preprocessor. So here, this is a preprocessor loop, and the preprocessor is in a language called LUA, Lua language, which is very common uh, for in, in the video game industry for scripting. So it's very easy to find documentation for it. And here, what I do is I write the expression that will generate the, the sine wave. It's actually a cosine here that I use, and I generate one period of this. You can see that you know I do two times pi times i, which is the iterator in the loop, divided by the number of samples I selected. And this produces all the values in the BRAM. And if we look indeed at the preprocessor output, we can see exactly this, right? You see this stream of values here. These are the values in the wave in the wave table. All done by the preprocessor, so super easy to change uh, if you want to edit it. For instance, the amplitude, I use uh, 1024, I could use something else. 
um, it's important to not put too much on the, the chip saturates, it seems. Um, so it sounds like a triangular signal, signal instead of a, of a sine wave. All right, so here we have generated the BRA. The next thing we do is to set up the uh, P mode, right? As I told you the P mode is actually an in out, right? It's an in out and it has uh, eight pins because there's eight active pins on this P mode. And so what I do here is I say I only want to use it as an output. So I put uh, 250, 255, in fact, so eight bits all to one into the output enable of the P mode. This turns everything into an output. And then I build the output by concatenating uh, various bits. And you can see that the four bits here are actually the signals, the variables that I defined here, right? So they are directly fed into the output of the P mode. And then here, I really don't care, so I just put zero. I could have put X to signify don't care as in Verilog. I just decided to ground them all. Uh, it probably doesn't matter, right? And so that's it. This syntax, colon equal, means that this assignment is done all the time. It's always done, right? I, I could have equivalently put it in always, but I like to do that. It's just a way to, to tell, to see this. this is done every clock cycle. And in fact, this will be turned into uh, something constant uh, by your sys, so they're always assigned to these uh, to these values, these two. All right, and then this entire algorithm is a single always block, because I want to do everything in a single cycle. Uh, I don't need uh, I don't need control flow, right? Because I do everything. Uh, I mean, I don't need control flow as in. Uh, in uh, just you know. a second. Uh, sure. All right, I think the presentation has shrunk for some reason. Oh, okay. Can you still see the screen or? Uh, it's basically a window. Okay. Uh, Shall I uh, stop and restart the sharing, maybe? It's fine for me. Uh, how about others, uh, Mr. Neil Aditya? Yeah, it looks fine for me. It looks fine? Okay, okay. so okay. it's probably mine. All right, so hopefully it comes back. Otherwise, please let me know in like one minute, and then I can stop and restart. Oh, no problem. I'll just look at it okay. the live stream. Yeah. All right, so so basically this algorithm is a single fine. always loop. Okay, so it's probably my yeah, it looks fine for me. All right, so it looks fine. Okay. Okay, please please let me know. I, I'm also looking at the chat, the text chat. So please let me know in the text chat, and then I can stop and restart if if needed. Um, all right, so this algorithm executes in a single cycle, so I don't need to do you know a while or whatever. I can just use a, a single always block. Um, and you know it's it's always better in terms of hardware usually if you if you can do that unless you really need a finite state machine of course in which case you you can describe it using uh, the other constraints. Um, the first thing I do here is to generate two tracked expressions. These are wires in Verilog, right? And what this does is that this is saying if count equals zero or if count equals the value of the half period, I, I create two boolean uh, variables which are uh, true when this is the case. So negage is true when the count is zero. That's because the, I know that I want the bit clock, the serial bit clock to go to zero. This is when the count is to zero. And this serial bit clock, I'm putting it to one when, I'm, when the counter, which is half the value of the total counter, right? Um, and this is a positive edge of the signal. So I'm, I'm creating these two bits that I use uh, later in the design. And these are not actual uh, flip-flops in terms of hardware. These are just wires because I'm tracking the values of this expression. And here you can see I'm using the wiring operator, the same as for bindings, but I'm using two columns because I'm explicitly saying I'm referring to the value of count at the start of the cycle, right? So I, I don't care if count is being modified within the cycle. It is at the end. It is modified here. But I don't care about that. I want the value at the start of the cycle. All right, and then this if here is basically refreshing the data. So if we are at the start of everything, uh, which means count is zero, so I'm on the negative edge of the bit clock, it just went down. I know because I'm generating it just below, okay, here. So I know it's just going down. If I have already done 32 uh, bits, I have already sent 32 bits before, and that's the initial state. Uh, the the low, low bit of mod 32 is one initially. Then I'm reading the data from the waveform. So I'm accessing our data from the wave, and I get the new data. And then, of course, what I do is I increment the address 
of the waveform to get the next value. It will take one cycle to come, but because of everything else is much longer, I don't have to worry about that. The only reason there is a little bit of uh, more complex things here is because I need to send twice the same, once for left, once for right. Okay, that's the only reason for this expression I'm highlighting here. Otherwise, if I'm you know on the negative edge of the serial bit signal, but I haven't yet sent 32 bits, I just shift the data to send the next bit. Okay, so I shift the data, and we're sending most significant bits first. So I'm shifting this to the left, and then on the data pin, I put the most significant bit of the data. The reason it's 15 and not 31 is because I decided to only send 16 bits, right? So after uh, the 16 bits are sent, anyway, this is zero. So the 16 following bits will be zero. Um, because this, this little device expects 32 bits, but if you send 16 and then followed by zero, it's all fine as well, all right? Um, and that's it for sending the data. And then the rest is just generating the clock. So what do I do? The clock here, it, this is a bit serial clock. If I look at the initialization, let me move quickly there. You can see that it's a single bit because it's a clock initialized to one, okay? But the first thing that happens on the very first clock cycle is that negage is true because the counter is zero. So negage is true, which means we are generating a negative edge. So we're flipping the bit. So it becomes zero because we just did the negative edge, okay, at the very first cycle. And then the count will increment when the count reach again zero because we have reached the final value for the counter. We reach again zero. It will generate, oh, sorry, uh, before that, it will reach half its value, pause edge, and we will generate the positive value, which means this will be true again. Then we generate the positive edge. Okay, now we're high again. And when the counter wraps around, we again generate. Uh, we again flip the clock and generate the negative edge. Okay, so the positive edge occurs when the counter is half its value, and the negative edge occurs when the counter is at zero. All right, that's how we generate it. Why do we do that? Because look, we are setting the data pin through this on the negative edge. Okay, so when we go back, when the clock goes back to zero, which means the data has been set for quite a while when the positive edge of the bit serial clock occurs. And this is important because this particular chip is sampling the value of the pin here when the bit clock goes to one on the positive edge of the bit clock. So that's why we're setting the data on the negative edge. And we know the chip is sampling on the positive edge. OK? And that's it. That's about all there is. Right, so I hope it was clear. Uh, I know it's, uh, it's, it's a lot uh, condensed, but hopefully through the syntax, you can sort of see how this operates. And that's basically all there is, all there is to, send, to generate a waveform and send it to this, uh, to this uh, little uh, device. You could change the wave here. You could change the frequency of the wave by changing num samples. You could generate a triangular wave just by uh, changing the, uh, the processing code. You could turn this entire thing into a small uh, driver that would be called from main. And this is probably the next thing I'm going to do so that people can reuse it, and so on and so forth. OK, with that, I will go to the conclusion of the talk. There are many, many other projects. So the first thing I encourage you to do is install CDs and then you know try out some of these projects. Hopefully, you have some of these boards. You can also try them in simulation. For instance, the Doom chip, if you go into it and you do make verilator, it will open a window and, and show you this uh, uh, rendering of, of the Doom chip. Of course, you can't interact with it, but at least you can verify that everything is working and you can play a little bit with it. Um, that's all. Thank you very much. I hope this was clear. This is the first time I was presenting, so I don't know. You know, it's, it's hard for me to decide what quantity of information and so on. So feedback is very welcome. Uh, I hope you'll find CVs useful. This is the URL of the main repo. Uh, and I would like to thank all the contributors uh, that uh, also participate uh, in, you know, keeping CVS alive and, and turning it into, into hopefully something very cool. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a few questions. Uh, so, sure. Yeah. So were you uh, inspired by BlueSpec Verilog in any way? Because it seems uh, a little similar in terms of philosophy, not, not in terms of syntax. Um, so to be honest, so again, right, you have to keep in mind, I, I started two years ago and, um, you know, the, the way I approach this is I learned Verilog and I thought, oh, you know, it, we could do like a little thing above it just to make our life more comfortable, right? 
and this is how I started. So it's not like I reviewed existing things and so on, right? I have to admit, I just dove into this and tried to do my own things that I would like to use, right? And so that's really why I know there's tons of cool things out there, um, right? There's a, there's a Migen or Migen, I don't know exactly how to pronounce it. There's a Chisel, there's so many cool stuff, right? Uh, happening uh, uh, around this kind of, of new languages. Um, you know, it's just that I started my own. Uh, I really like it the way it is. Uh, since then, I looked a bit at the others. I, I, I still enjoy more the one I did. So I'm, I'm you know, dedicated to pursuing it, but I, I, I can't really provide a comparison or, for, for instance, I'm not familiar with BlueSpec. I heard the name before, but I don't know what it, uh, what it does. No, I meant uh, philosophically, it seems sim uh, similar mm -hmm. because it's uh, like the module design that you have done, the algorithms uh, mapping to the blue spec modules are somewhat similar. Uh, the other Sounds thing good. I will definitely check it out. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, the other thing uh, I wanted to know is like sometimes you mix the preprocessor directives directly into the code. So yeah. that kind of uh, like, wouldn't that be confusing to anyone? Uh, Yes, it could. I mean, uh, so there are. So the thing is, the reason the preprocessor is so present is because it allows very important things such as uh, uh, generating series code automatically. So, for instance, uh, if you do, uh, and I have I have this example, right? If you do um, a pipeline uh, multiplier, for instance, you can you can write it from the preprocessor, and depending on the you, you know, depending on the pipeline configuration you want, the preprocessor can generate different types of codes, right? Um, you can do really extreme things with the preprocessor. For instance, in the case of the Doom chip, the preprocessor is extracting data from, from the game and writing hardware, which is custom generated from the data itself, right? Um, you can also do things like, you know, you're doing a RISC-V processor. There are, there are actually two different RISC-V processors in, in the series project, the ICE-5 and the FIRE-5. And when, when you do that, the preprocessor is, is taking the compiled code and putting it into the VRAM automatically, for instance. Um, so it is important to be aware of the preprocessor when you write series code. I would say you can go a long way without it. But but for many more advanced things, you really want to dive into it and to understand how it works. So that's why it's a bit interleaved. Uh, and then there's a matter of how of style, right? Trying to write it in a way that is not too much of a burden uh, inside the code. Just know that there is a little bit more genericity coming uh, into Cilis, uh, so that you don't necessarily have to rely on the preprocessor. For instance, uh, like I said, you can have general interfaces. And so let's say you are using an interface. You don't know the width of a data bus, but you need to create a variable that has the same width as a data bus. You have something called same as. So you do same as a variable to declare another variable that will be the same as the other one, right? You can also use width of, which is the width of a particular signal. And this is all directly in CDs, not through the preprocessor. So there's a, the, the boundary between both is, is moving a little bit. Uh, yeah, the main reason I asked that is, uh... OK, so this is like a transpiler between your language and Verilog, right? And Verilog has certain constraints uh, to how it maps to the lookup tables uh, or how many uh, multiplier blocks it uses. So something like this might uh, affect the floor planning of your design or like affect the power management. So uh, absolutely. Right, so for instance here, uh, this is not exa exactly reflecting what you are saying, but but for instance, this piece of preprocessor code here is changing the code being generated based on the board, right? So, and I have the same for the SDRAM, for instance, depending on whether you're on a D10 Nano with a, a child board or whether you're on the ULX3S, it will use a different memory controller. Uh, so you can very locally change what code is being generated depending on that. Uh, I, I meant from the perspective of large designs, it would be hard to reason if something goes wrong on uh, this, right? Because it would, uh, so because you're transpiling to Verilog and Verilog has certain, uh, so it would map certain statements to a lookup table, for instance, or it mm -hmm. might make some uh, references that are maybe not as, uh, as let's say power optimized or area optimized, or it, uses up too much of the lookup tables or uses up too much of the multipliers if you're filling like floating point. Uh... Right. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. So no, is there I mean, any way, or I'm, actually, yeah. can you can you mention? So because we use constraints in Verilog, right? So we can mm -hmm. actually do that with, uh, with say the so Xilinx with Wado or something. We have the planning tool ah, over there. Okay, okay. So do, do you mean okay? You mean decorating your Verilog to tell the the synthesizer yes, and yes, place and route? Yes. Oh, okay, okay, I see. So yes, there are ways to do that. So um, there is something I haven't shown. You can you can have attributes to some of the things that would directly be ported to the Verilog uh, code. You can also very easily interface with Verilog module. So for instance, let's say, let's say you want to use a particular DSP block that you really want to instantiate in Verilog, or that you need to do a, a multiplier with a specific um, uh, uh, synthesizer uh, uh, command right? that you attach to it. You can do that in a, in a little Verilog module, and you can super easily import this Verilog module and instantiate it in Silis with the same syntax as you instantiate the algorithms, right? So that's one way. If you really have to go down to this uh, level of detail, you, you can do it. Um, I, I mean, I've been there, right? So the thing is, for instance, if you generate a design with Silis, it, it produces Verilog code. You open it in, let's say, uh, Quartus or, uh, or Vivado, and it will give you a report. And from the report, usually, you, you can go back to see this code. Uh, and uh, I'm in the process of making this even easier than it is now. And you can adjust things to, to make sure that you use the specific constraints. But if you have to use special blocks or to ensure it's used in a very specific way, the best way is to do it in Verilog and import the module in CDs, which is super easy. Um, maybe I can try to find an example of that if, while I take the next question, if you, if you want. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you're, you're welcome. No, no, it's a, it, it makes a lot of sense. It's a, it's an important question. Let me actually very quickly, if I go to a SDRAM controller, uh, I think I have some of that because in the SDRAM controllers, uh, yeah, you see, for instance, this here, this is because I need to use very specific IO pads that depend on the FPGA that is being used, right? And so, for instance, for the ULX3S here, I'm importing very log modules. Uh, and these very log modules are then directly used. You see this one is directly used using the same syntax. So when you import a very log module, it's an it's it's like an algorithm that you can bind to the variables using exactly the same syntax with exactly the same uh, definition for everything. So it's super easy. And here that's one case where I really need to use uh, dedicated very log modules because these things uh, maybe we can find them. Uh, where is it? Uh, it should be there. Yes, for instance, this one, you know, this is like instantiating some, some very specific uh, constructs of the actual FPGA hardware, right? So that's how you could you could use it. You could do it. And, and again, CDS is really built to be completely interoperable with Verilog, right? And so the idea is if Verilog makes more sense or if you need it, it's it's right there for you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? OK, thank you very much. Uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sylvain Lefebvre. Um, thank you. And, and again, if there's feedback on the presentation by mail or, or whatever, I'm very happy to hear it, I including if it wasn't clear, was too fast or whatever, please let me know. <laughs> oh, sure, absolutely, absolutely. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for taking the time for the to give the presentation. And thank you to the community for tuning in and joining us for the event. Um, that concludes today's event. Um, uh, this is the end of uh, our first inaugural event for the SISDRUG, um, the South Indian SDR Users Group. Um, we will post uh, the videos, uh, the video for this event on our YouTube channel. And uh, all the materials and slides and things like that from the event for all the speakers will be posted uh, on our website as well. Uh, the YouTube channel will, will, will contain the video and any associated slides or materials and things like that will be available on our events page on our website. Um, please uh, uh, keep in touch and, and keep communicating with us. Our next event is going to be in October, uh, tentatively on Saturday, October 23. So in the meantime, that's three months away, we'll, we'll be doing these events approximately every three months uh, going forward. So uh, please keep in touch with us and, uh, and keep in touch with the community. 
we hope that we can form a, a larger community on Slack and uh, engage people for technical discussions and questions and conversations and uh, uh, all of those things around software defined radio and wireless communications. Um, uh, so please uh, join the Slack channel if you can. Uh, if you'd like to reach any of us on the organizing committee, uh, you can do that over Slack. You can email us directly. We have a, a uh, email address for the for the organizing committee itself. Um, and you can uh, keep uh, keep in touch with us on Twitter. We'll be posting uh, uh, other information and uh, notification about upcoming events uh, on our Twitter feed. We'll, we'll certainly post them in Slack as well. Um, and there's an announcements page on our website where we'll uh, also post in there too. So there's multiple ways to keep in touch uh, with us and with the community and, and be uh, uh, alerted about upcoming events. Um, we hope that you can make the time to join us on October 23rd. And if you're watching this uh, uh, event on a recording, if you have any questions for any of the speakers, uh, you, can, you can put them in Slack or you can email uh, the organizing committee and we'll pass the questions on. Uh, to the speakers and uh, and get you a reply. Uh, we really hope to to see people on Slack where all of us are very active on Slack and there's a whole community there to discuss uh, uh, um, all kinds of technical things and and you know questions and conversations all around um, uh, software defined radio and, and wireless communications and and all of those all of those topic areas. Um, so. Uh, we hope to see you again in future events in October and beyond. Uh, again, please do keep in touch with us. Please join Slack, uh, create an account on the workspace, and uh, and become active. the 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 community is, uh, uh, you know, the value of the community grows as the as more people are in the community. So we really hope that you'll take the time to join um, our Slack workspace. Um, that's the end of the event, and. Uh, uh, Again, thank you for everybody for, for watching today live. And if you're watching this recording, thanks for taking the time to watch it. Um, so, uh, so with that, I'll turn off the recording and end the, the video. And we'll see you next time. Thank you again. Bye-bye.